Hallelujah. You guys are going to learn a lot tonight. Oh, <laughs> Hallelujah. And I have a pointer to make it. <laughs> the light show. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, living God. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, mighty God. For the rivers of living water. Well, open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. I'm going to talk to you about the first resurrection. And I think this is a good place to start. I'm going to start at the end of the first resurrection. And you're going to understand what I mean by that by, this, by the time we're finished here tonight. I'm going to start at the end of the first resurrection. And it's Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. And you can see here in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, the Lord says, And I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment, judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ Jesus a thousand years. This is talking about the martyred saints, those who are beheaded for the gospel or for their for their the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and because they stood in the company of the saints through the, the tribulation. And then I just want to point out one other thing to you before I get into this, and verse eleven then would show you the second resurrection, which is the general resurrection of the wicked dead, which does not happen to the end of the the end of the thousand years. And at the end of the thousand years, and I'm just going to place that in there so that you can understand where we're at. Verse 11, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away and there was found no place for them. Understand, this is the wicked dead. This is not the mixture. This is the wicked dead. Okay, this is wrath. We're scared. This is not presented with, before him with boldness. Okay, all right, are you with me in confidence? You right, you understand, you understand the verse of scripture I'm referring to when I say that. And and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. See the gave up their dead which were in it, death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. Death and hell has nothing to do with the saints, neither does the the information re regarding the sea giving up the dead. This is the second Resurrection, this is, this is the resurrection of the unrighteous, the wicked dead. Everyone who died uh, not uh, in, in sin and rebellion. Let's put it that way, just in general. Everyone who died in sin and rebellion. They do not, there is not a resurrection for those who died in sin and rebellion, who lifted up their eyes in hell, being in torment until the very, very end, the very finality of all things. The, where this is, where ultimately things go is that Jesus is going to reign for a thousand years and he will destroy the last enemy and the last enemy is death. At that time, Gog is loose for a little season. Gog is another term, term, term for Satan and Magog simply means the nations. It's not a geographical location. That is something that has been spun by, by lay ministers over the past 20, 20 years. It's not something that holds any water theologically. So the idea that Gog and Magog is Russia, that's lay preaching. There's people who don't really understand the word that, very, that well. And that's just the way it is. I'm, I'm, I don't say that facetiously. I say that in the company of theologians. So, you know, I don't know of any theologian who believes that because you just can't support that scripturally. Say so, but at any rate, God looses Satan, allows Satan to be loosed for a thousand years at the end of the millennial reign. The Lord's always going to give and provide a place for those who do not want to do what's right, who want to practice wickedness. He's going to find a, he's, those who want to give themselves over to deception. There will always be a place to gather them. And literally, it's, it's a crazy concept that at the end of a thousand years after being under the reign, of the Lord Jesus and Father coming down and visiting and all that was going on. And, you know, the 
the resurrected saints there ruling and reigning with them, that there would be so many people that would resort to Satan after all of that beauty and all that splendor for 1,000 years, that so many, on the, and, and, and they're numbered on the level of being as the number of the sand upon the seashore, innumerable company. And of course, after a 1,000 years of no one dying, you know, that's going to be, that's quite, that, that's quite a, a, a population growth. Uh, you know, um, and, and, and so, you know, it, for those of you who haven't been through all the uh, study here in the book of Revelation over the past, you know, 12 times that I've done this study, I believe this is the 12th one, it's something like that. What is this? This is the 10th one? Is this is the ninth one? Is, or we're down to ninth? I, I didn't think it was that few, but nonetheless, if you haven't been in all of them, we have them on YouTube. There's a lot of information here. I'm going to just give you some general information. I want to talk to you tonight about the resurrection. It's such an important subject. I want you to understand that, by and large, you have, um, you, you have, let me just say this. You're going to have some, uh, a company of people that come out of the tribulation that are mortal, everyday, natural human beings. And they will go into the millennial reign of Christ as natural human beings. And I just felt to, the need to make that point after saying after a thousand years, no one dying. People still going on with God's plan that he had given to Adam and Eve to replenish and fill the earth. That's going to be going on for a thousand years, that company of people. Now, Jesus is going to rule with a rod of iron during this period of time. He's going to smash the nations with the rod of iron. He's going to rule with, as a fuller soap. He's going to rule as a finer's fire and with a rod of iron. And he's going to subdue everything. He's going to bring everything into the subjection, in subjection and obedience unto God. <clears throat> and yet at the end of the thousand years, there's still going to be a great company of people that are going to literally come up against the living God to fight against him, to try to destroy him. Emphasizing that wherever there is a little bit of sin, it's ultimately going to result in such a iniquity and such a rebellion that people will not want anything to do with the author of life. The, little, the littlest, smallest amount of sin will ultimately result in you hating God so much that you want to destroy him, kill him. Pretty radical statement, isn't it? But at the end of the thousand years, you know, and I'm kind of jumping ahead, I'm in Revelation 21 and 22 now, but at the end of the thousand years, the Lord's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And it will never, will never be another possibility of sin. <laughs> it will be purged. Wherein dwells only righteousness. It will be purged. The event of, of what Satan did when he tried to exalt his throne above the throne of God that you read about in Isaiah chapter 14, that you read about in Ezekiel chapter 28. That's never, never going to happen again. The universe completely purged. Sin and rebellion and iniquity all contained in a place <clears throat> called hell that was created for the devil and his angels because man wasn't around when it was created. So there's many things to say here, but um, what I'm going to do is I just want to jump here into the first resurrection, begin to talk to you about some things. I'm going to point out some things for you, and, um, and then, you know, I'll start giving you more established, script, some more scriptures to help establish you in it. I love time points. I... Time points pegged in the ground, reference points allows us to determine where we're at, where we've been, and where we're going, okay? And so what happened was Daniel, when he was seeking God about the restoration of Israel, wanting to know, Father, when are you going to come? When are you going to fulfill all the things that you plan to do with us, all those things that you promised Abraham, all those things that you declared by your servants, the prophets? When is it going to happen? And of course, we know that where Daniel is at the time is he's in Babylon. Babylon was a, a place, a nation of rebellion created by this, this perfect first uh, an type of an antichrist. And you could say he's an antichrist but in, in, the, in a sense of typology, and that was Nimrod. Nimrod led the rebellion as the, as the Assyrian. He's the one. His dad, was, his, his dad was Cush. His uncle was Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim meets Egypt. And, and all that Nimrod was doing ultimately began to fill all of the earth. And, 
His purpose was to gather all humanity together and rule over them. He was a hunter of men. And thus the bow, and thus also the bow of, of Revelation chapter 6 under the first seal. When the Antichrist is first revealed, he looks like the Messiah. He's believed by the Jews to be the Messiah. Listen, you, you just want you to understand this. No, he, he's by type Antichrist, Anti-Messiah. Jesus said, I came, I came unto you, I was your own, you refuse me not. Another one will come who is not your own. Him you're going to, I mean, you refuse me. There's another one that's going to come like me. Him you, will, him you will accept, you will not refuse. Talking of the Antichrist. The, the Israel is going to see him as the Messiah. And I guarantee you, there's, they, you don't get past their radar of specific, specifications on that. And I'm not going to go into that. I'm not going to show the proofs of that tonight. I've alluded to them. I, because, you know, over these past nine um, uh, studies, I'm just giving you surface stuff. This is, there's, it goes far, far deeper. You get to surface stuff, and you talk to me about where I get to the point, I feel like you got the general overview. I'll, I'll be, I'm happy to take you deeper. But the important point is these time points. Daniel saw 70 weeks. When Daniel saw 70 weeks, okay, so let's say I'm in Babylon now, okay, and the Lord's going to show me 70 weeks. See, this right here says, 70 weeks determined upon the people of Israel and the holy city. Daniel 9, 24. It's upon the people of Israel. If anybody can not get that, you're not going to understand prophecy. It is upon the people of Israel and the holy city. It has nothing to do with the church. It has nothing to do with the goyim. Nothing to do with the nations. God is showing Daniel What's going to happen with his people, the nation of Israel, how Father is going to deal with them. So Daniel is looking, and the prophets are looking. And let's just say that that, that that wall right there where I have the pointer, let's just say that that wall is the end of the eternal future, and I'm going to just basically start that wall with, uh, the, with God coming down out of heaven with the new Jerusalem, okay? The eternal perfect earth, okay? And here I am, and I'm Daniel. The bottom line of it is, I don't see anything about the church. It's down here in a valley. I see the cross. I can see the, the Antichrist. I can see uh, events in the future, but I can't see the church. It's revealed. It's not revealed to me. So I can see, from where I'm at, I can see different time points. I see, number one, I see the first Seven weeks of the, see, God gave Daniel a vision of 70 weeks that go across here. And I can see right here, I can see the first seven weeks, which is 49 years. And that is the, the rebuilding of, of the temple uh, under, under Nehemiah and Ezra. And then I can see another time period of another uh, 42 weeks. Uh, and, and then you combine all of that and now we got... 42 plus 7, we got 49. I can see all the way to the cross. I can see to the coming of the Messiah when he's cut off. Daniel saw that. And 2,000 years ago, the 69th week start, stopped. But Daniel did it not know that it wasn't continuous from the cross all the way through to the 70th week. See, the 70th week doesn't start over here until some events happen. And people want to take the church into the 70th week. It's a totally different administration. It's back to temple worship. Read your Bible. <laughs> I mean, now what's happening here, one of the great pegs in the ground, both New Testament and Old Testament, is the abomination that makes desolate. Right here in the middle of the, 70th, the 70th week. Which, once again, it's, it's a week of, of, of years. So it's a week of, one week is seven years. Okay? You see that? That's the way that it was laid out. For Daniel. And he, well, I mean, you don't see that if you don't have the scriptures in front of you. But after nine uh, meetings, you should see that because the Lord lays it out in <laughs> such chrono chronological order. He gives number of days. He gives number of months, right? And he gives number of years. So there's no reason that we're going to have to, we're, that we're going to fail here. But the time I'm done here tonight, you're going to say, what? There is no, what, what? There is no catching away for the church, the most glorious event. There is no resurrection. The most glorious event in the, in the tribulation, in the book of Revelation. When the tribulation starts. Why is it that people are having such a rough time? Where is the confusion at? And so, I mean, the bottom line of it is, 
even if you even if you got wild eyed with symbolism, it's very very hard to see a resurrection take place during the tribulation. It's just uh, you know, but but nonetheless, I, I want to equip you. So here we go. We've got the church. So somebody says, when is the first resurrection? Good question. It actually started with Jesus right there. You see that right there? That time point right there. Now I have verses of scripture up here. And, and we know, of course, this is central to who we are and what we believe. And everybody knows that Jesus is the first fruits of, res of, of the resurrection. You can read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 20, seeing that he is the first fruits of the resurrection. We know that. That's when the first resurrection began then. So if he's the first fruits of the first resurrection, then really it began with him. But then you can look, go look in your Bibles real quickly. Turn to Matthew chapter 27, 52 through 53. Matthew 27, 52 through 53. When he rose up from the dead, guess what happened? Other Old Testament saints came out of the grave and they walk around Jerusalem. Don't tell me that they were raised up to be alive and die again because there's just no concept for that. They were raised up. They were, <laughs> they were raised up and in the first resurrection along with Jesus because that's what God chose to do. So it really began there. And they already in heaven in their resurrected body just like Jesus is. So you see that? You read that, Matthew? You see that right there? You want me to read it? Huh? Did you turn there? Are you? Yeah. And the graves, here it is. And the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection. Somebody said it was before his resurrection. No. It's a parenthetical statement centered around the cross. But after his resurrection. He's the first fruits of the resurrection. So then we got it. We, now we begin to deal with some very in, important things. When is, the, when, when is this big event that Paul talked about in 1 Thessalonians and, and 1 Corinthians? So I, I want you to go there with me. And start with First Corinthians, First Thessalonians, rather. Let's go to First Thessalonians, chapter four. And um, we could start at verse sixteen, but uh, this is probably the best place to start. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven. Hallelujah. Where does the Lord descend from heaven in the Book of Revelation? Where? In the book of Revelation, during the tribulation, does the Lord descend from heaven? Doesn't even exist. Doesn't even, can't make believe it. Okay? Can't even make, you're going to tell me that the greatest event that has taken place in the history of, of, of man and, in, and, and, and really in many respects, the, the whole creation of God isn't going to be featured? If it's happening there, give me a break, huh? See, what happens is when we start in the book of Revelation, okay, I want you to see this. We see in Revelation 1.19, very important thing. Paul, in Revelation 1.19, the Lord Jesus says to John, because he's going to give us some more time points. Get this, time points, 70 weeks. 69 happened up to the cross. Nothing's happened in between for 2,000 years. The 70th hasn't started. What is the 70th like? It's just like the first 69. It's focused on Israel as a nation. And that's, what ev that's why all of the terminology goes back to Old Testament terminology. It goes back to uh, Mosaic terminology, temple worship. You can't have something that makes the, a temple desolate uh, or uh, the, the, the concept of something that would make the temple desolate desolate an abomination that would make the temple desolate or or abandoned of the presence of God <laughs> can't even happen unless the presence of God is there it's temple worship it's built in troublesome times everything focuses on that it, it blows your mind why because that times of the Gentiles has come to an end it ain't about saving nobody in fact when you look at it is, the harvest is over. There is no more harvest. And, and, and the, all, you have in the, all you have in Revelation is a proof of that time and time again. And still they will not repent. They would rather at the very beginning of the tribulation, they would rather the rocks fall upon them and smash them. 
so that they don't have to look at the, the, the throne of God and the Lamb. You, come on. Somebody said our greatest hour. You tell me that our greatest hour is in when God's pouring out his wrath upon the heathen. I'm telling you not. It's not. Because what's actually happening while this is going on in the 70th week is the only time period where the judgment seat of Christ goes down and the marriage supper of the Lamb takes place. And then Jesus comes back with those who are the resurrected saints. At the end, right there, you can see it. Revelation chapter 19. Then he comes back. He returns. He will come with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment upon all the ungodly, which the ungodly deeds of ungodly, the ungodly have, uh, have committed. For all their ungodly deeds, which the ungodly have committed. So, I, 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 want, you, I want you to grasp these timelines. I want, you to, I want you to think about 70 weeks. What's that about? That timeline is so crucial. Daniel is so thorough in his interpretation. God makes every symbolism known to him. There is no reason for anybody to be confused. Then, then we have the time point of the abomination that makes this desolate, which is in the middle of the week. I'll tell you right now. Can anybody know the day or the hour in which the Lord will return? Huh? Come on, answer me. Participate. If you don't know, you don't know. You can say, I don't know. If Christ Jesus were not to come, Sometime before the abomination makes desolate, I can tell you the very day is coming. We have, we have the numbers of the days, the very days. So it's by, by virtue of that, it's already eliminated. You can't have some, some coming of the Lord Jesus Christ after the, the, the abomination that makes desolate. Because we have the very number of days. I've gone through that with you. I've numbered the days with you. I've got the number of the months. I can take you out, out to the outside limit of of what's going to happen, you know, for you know, 30 to 60 days after that even, okay? Are you with me? I want you to grab these time points. If I can get you these time points, if you can memorize these time points, if you can have reference points, then you're going to know where you're at at any point. I got, a t I got a peg in the ground. I know where I've come from. I know where I'm at. I know where I'm going. I can interpolate or extrapolate, either one. No problems. Now, looky here. Looky here. So in Revelation 1.19, he says, write the things which are. So he showed him, or rather, what, write the things which you see, which you see. You see that? Revelation 1.19, write things which you see. That's Revelation chapter 1. He said, write the things which are. That's the church. That's been 2,000 years. Write the things which are. That's been 2,000 years. It's to address the seven church, seven churches. And then he says, write the things which shall be hereafter. It doesn't stand out as much to people if you're reading English, but when you're reading the Greek... <laughs> and you see, write the things which shall be hereafter. The, the phrase is metatato. And then when you hit Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, it says metatato. It sets for us the very point of this is what is hereafter. Hereafter what? Hereafter the church. Hereafter the church. There is a hinderer of iniquity, the man of sin, the Antichrist, the anti-Messiah, the false Messiah, which, by the way, the Jews are going to recognize as the Messiah until, until he makes the abomination inside the temple. Then they're going to realize he's the false Messiah. But he's going to fool them for a while. He's going to look like a man of peace. Even, even today, scholars look at him with a, on a white horse under the first seal with a bow, Nimrod's bow in his hand and think he's the Messiah. Jesus is not coming with no bow. He don't have a bow. He slay the wicked with the sword of his mouth. Okay, he's the false Messiah. It's hard to recognize. Are you listening to me? He was as the 13th or 12th or 13th Imam. No, he, no. Besides that, 12th or 13th Imam cannot arise until the whole world is on fire. Death and destruction, chaos like never seen before. Okay? <laughs> so... You know, and it just doesn't even fit, and I can tell you why. Somebody said, oh, well, you know, it, aren't, aren't we talking, when we talk about Babylon, and we talk about all these things, are we talking about, I had a person ask me the other day, when we're talking about Babylon, spiritual and literal, aren't we talking about the Roman Catholic Church? Well, I, I said, well, why would you even say that? Well, it sits upon seven mountains. What are you talking about? Well, there's seven hills in Rome. You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> it's not even seven. It's actually eight. Go count them up again. And besides that, 
Rome, the Lord says that seven mountains are seven kings, which are seven kingdoms. And we already know which the, the, who they are because Daniel's already revealed them to us. Now we come in the book of Revelation, we see them again. And, and somebody said, well, it can't it be Islam. No, it can't be Islam because Islam, Mohammedism wasn't around even in the Roman Empire. And this whore, this great whore, has to be associated with every one of those kingdoms, starting with Egypt. Why Egypt? Because Egypt's the first one to oppress Israel, then Assyria, then Babylon, then Media Persia, then Greece, then Rome, then the seventh that shall arise after Rome, which will shall arise right there at the end of the church age, which, which shall be led, as I've told you already, shall be led by the anti-Messiah, the, the, the false Messiah. The one who's everything contrary to the Messiah, the little horn, where we know where he comes from. And as I proved it, and I'll give you more proofs if you want them. He's an Assyrian. He's a Jewish Assyrian. And he can be traced to have been born in Bethlehem of Judea. He's going to have all, every type. He's going to pass every examination of the priest. And I'm not going to go into all those details tonight, but right there is where he's going to start. And he's going to make war. And he's going to make war with Turkey and he's going to make war with Greece and he's going to make war with Egypt. And it's not just the territories that we would define as Greece. It's the Grecian Empire, the first Grecian Empire under Philip. That's all of Macedonia. OK, it's not just the Egypt, Egyptian empires. We would see Egypt now. It, incur, it, it includes Libya to Morocco, down to Ethiopia and up into uh, southern Jordan. It, well, at least into Arabia, not quite into southern Jordan. And, and so, you know, I'm not going to go back over all of those, but he's going to be doing that for the first three and a half years. That's what he's going to be doing. What are we going to be doing? There's the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ doesn't happen anywhere else. Where else does the judgment seat of Christ? I've got 10 questions that anybody that believes that they're going to go through the tribulation, that the church goes through the tri tribulation, I have 10 questions that not a person on the planet can answer if they believe that. 10 questions that not a person on the planet can answer. And I just want, I, I want people, I don't want people to get distracted. But, you know, I used to, I, people used to say, oh, the Lord's coming, the Lord's coming. I said, well, you know what? <laughs> they haven't said, I haven't been hearing people say he's delayed his coming. Now I hear it everywhere. They del he's delayed his coming. I grew up with a person named, I, when I grew up, I grew up around a lot of the men of God. And one of the men of God that I grew up around calling, I call him uncle. I called him uncle Bill. His name was, his name was Bill Britton. And, and Bill Britton, you know, God did a lot of things through him and used him in great ways. He was actually my dad's campaign manager when my dad was young in the ministry, when he was, you know, one of the big itinerant evangelists of the United States. And um, at any rate, he had a revelation one day, and his revelation was on the manifested sons. And his concept of the manifested sons, where there would be the manifested sons of God, the church would come to a place of great glory and grace as the manifested sons of God during the tribulation. He's the first one that really began to advance in a radical way to uh, the America, through the United States of America and Europe, that the church would go through the tribulation. Before that, you very rarely ever hear such a thing. And so all these things are close and very uh, close to, to my life, and, and I've been impacted by a lot of the various different things. So it's not like, you know, it's not like, you know, people come to me and they say, well, we, you know, the church is going to go through the tribulation. I'm not, I'm not going to get all irate. I'm going to say, you're going to have to prove it to me, prove that to me. And then they'll go to certain obscure scriptures, which you, which you, which you really need to be a, a very skilled Greek student to fully appreciate, like 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And... And then the rest of it is kind of just, just kind of trying to, trying to argue from, you know, some kind of a, a logical explanation of why the church needs to go through the tribulation because saints are, rec saints are viewed in, in, the old, in, 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 in the book of Revelation and other, you know, abstract things like that, which really, they, they're not going to total up. So it's really the most important thing for me to train you is, for you, first and foremost, to clearly understand the most important questions to ask. You know, I was, I, I grew up around people that said, listen, you know, if you can't prove it's wrong, rather, yeah, if you can't prove, it, prove it's wrong, then it may be right. And it's a good approach to a problem. And that way you don't get all compromised with you're trying to prove something, you know, because you are just all persuaded about it. No. Try to prove that the church goes through the tribulation. Try to prove it. 
<laughs> you ain't gonna be able to prove that. And if you do, I mean, come on. I, I'm, I'm the first to stand in line and say, you know, I'm gonna repent. I'm, praise God, man. You, got, you had to have new chapters created. They don't exist. And I'm not being arrogant about it. This isn't even my chart. This is Larkin's chart. Clarence Larkin has great charts. I just did edits to Clarence Larkin's charts. And, you know, he, was, he did this back in the early 1900s. And so, you know, look at this. Jesus still, he shall descend. Somebody said, oh, it's the, it's the 144,000. It, no, no, no. They say it's the man child. The man child? A revelation chapter. Well, really, prove that to me. Well, um, the man child should rule with a rod of iron. Well, everybody that's ruling with Jesus is ruling with a rod of iron. Well, so the man child either has to be Jesus or the church. No, 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 no. It just doesn't even fit because let's look at the symbolism of Revelation chapter 12. There was a woman, a sun clothed woman. Okay? The sun clothed woman was already translated. The, the, the interpretation was already given to us by Jacob. Joseph had the dream. You remember? This, the woman, the sun and the moon and the 12 stars. Jo Joseph said, The sun, the moon, and the 11 stars came and bowed down to me. And jo what did Jacob say? What are you saying? What are you saying, son? You're saying that me, your mom, and your brother are going to come and bow down to you? And exactly that's what he was saying because that's pretty much what happened. But he already, the vision already, the symbolism already existed. The symbolism, is, symbolism furthermore, with the sun clothed woman is already very plainly given in chapter 13 and chapter 14. Once again, it's Israel. She, she's Israel. And what does Israel bring forth? Why is the man, why is the 144,000? which are the only ones that God recognizes as his people on the earth. Hello. Can you see me out there in TV land? In chapter 7, Revelation chapter 7, God's got only one group of people that he identifies as his on the earth. It's 144,000, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Somebody, some woman stood up and said, I'm one of those. I belong to the tribe of Dan. Well, lady, first and foremost, number one, you have to be a virtuous Jew who's not known a woman. And you fail on that count. Not that you're not virtuous, but you're a woman. And second of least, Secondly, the tribe of Dan ain't even in there. It's the only one left out. But we're going to move. We're moving right along. This is where people's logic goes. There's 144,000. He says, wait, don't do nothing until I seal them. I want them to be kept. And then guess what? Right there, when we see the symbolism, because Revelation chapter 12 is the most symbolic of all of the chapters in the book of Revelation. The dragon opens up his mouth to pour out a flood to destroy the woman and the man child. The earth opens up, swallows up the swallows up the flood, you know, and then you know the beautiful symbolism there. The next thing, what do you see? 144,000. Where are they? In heaven. They 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 raptured. They're caught away. Somebody said the rapture is not in the Bible. It's ridiculous. It is. You know, there's several ways to translate the Greek word. One of them is rapture. And somebody said, well, it's more perfectly translated catching white. It doesn't matter. It means the same thing. <laughs> and so when somebody comes out, oh, rapture is done in the church. Oh, they're poly parroting. Some, somebody who, who just really didn't know anything. They read it out of a book. They didn't study it out for themselves. How many people really study out for themselves what they believe? Very few people. All they do is preach whatever somebody else said. And I don't want you preaching what I said. I want you, all I want to do is encourage you to go study and find out for yourself, gone in this last day, intended to everybody have a Bible in their hand. Obviously. I mean, we got stacks of Bibles. Oh, we can have Bibles on our computer, on our iPhone, on the iPad. I got, we got Bibles everywhere. I got all kinds of Bibles. I got Bibles in Latin, Bibles in Hebrew and Greek. I got Bibles in Aramaic. I mean, you know, Syriac. Spanish Bibles. I got Papua New Guinea Bible Pigeon. New Guinea Pigeon Bibles. I got Nepali Bibles. How many Bibles you got? Everybody go study your Bible. Well, watch what translation. I don't care. Doesn't even matter. When you get tripped up on a word, you have to, everybody has to go to the same place. Where's that? The Greek text. Or the Hebrew text. Not to the Oxford Dictionary. Because that ain't, that's not gonna work. You go to the Greek text 
And now the Lord has made it so simple that everybody can be scholars because now you can get Bibles where you just point and click on the Greek word and boom, it's going to pop up and you're going to hear it pronounce the Greek word for you. And then it's going to give every possible definition that you could have, every possible meaning of that Greek word. And then you can go ahead and consult four or five different Bible reference Bibles like King James and, uh, you know, uh, Young's Literal, Green's Literal, and several other literal translations to look at the landscape of the various different possible, possible ways of translating this word, uh, which would then bring 100 plus scholars to the table. So we, I, want you, I, want you to, I want to just show you, you know, how to go study. You know, we go to school to learn how to study. We didn't go to learn, school to learn to get, to get a degree, to get a better job. We went to school. This is what you're supposed to go to school for. Some of us, were, this is what we went to school. We went to school to learn how to study. We went to, learn to, went to school to learn to develop skills to allow us to study. Where otherwise, if you didn't have the skills, if you didn't speak Hebrew and Greek, if you didn't understand how to work your way through Akkadian or Eucharist, you're not going to get very far in linguistics, biblical linguistic studies. So that's why you do it. Okay? Don't go, you don't go so you can carry your, where your, no one does this, right? Where's their degree around their, their neck? But, okay. <clears throat> So I want, I just, I want, I want you to get, I want you to grasp the general overview of this. He shall descend. Where? There is no descent. He shall descend. Descend. See that word descend? Where does Jesus descend at? Where does Jesus, where is there any possibility of any Jesus descending in the book of Revelation? Tell me where it's at. Tell me, give me the verse of scripture. Tell me where it's at. Show me, tell me where it's at. Come on, folks, folks, you can do that quickly. Just give me the chapter. No, you can't give me the chapter? Have you guys been going home and doing your homework? That's why you haven't had any questions to ask me at the end of the meeting. Then you know what? What happens if you don't have a total recall and a photographic memory and you go to the class and don't go home and then follow up? What happens? You fail. You fell. It's true. You fell. Huh? You're going to have to take this and you're going to go study it out. Because if you study it out, I'm giving you, I'm advancing you 50 years of research. I'm, hand, I'm handing you maybe more than that. Where you would have to spend 50 years, 8, 10 hours a day to get what we get spoon feeding you. To laying it out. Now all you got to do is go sort it out and search it out. And now you get to read. Now you get to go read the verse of scripture where it allows you to wait. Wait a minute. I understand the 70 weeks. I understand the symbolism of Daniel. I understand how the symbolism of Daniel relates to the symbolism of the book of Revelation. Ah, I understand that Jesus made the, uh, the abomination that makes desolate such a, 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 a very important key uh, point. I understand that Daniel did as well. I understand the value of that in the, in the, in, in the interpretation of Scripture. So it's, Re it's Revelation chapter 19, isn't it? Yeah, verse 14. What is it? When does that happen? After the marriage supper. After the marriage supper. So if Jesus is coming then, you missed out. Sorry, it was great. It was great. And when, but you weren't here. But the bottom line of it is, does Jesus return into heaven with his saints? He comes down, he fights against the battle. He fights the battle of Armageddon which you read about in Revelation chapter 19, 20. Does it go back? Does we all, we all finished up? Ha, ah, we're done. Woo. Of course, we don't do anything. We just watch. He does it all. <laughs> he doesn't return. He, he comes and he stays. He stays. Hello. He's here. He's not going anywhere. He's setting up the kingdom. We're here. Praise God. We're moving in. Lock, stock, and barrel. What, Jesus is going to do all the battle. We're carrying stuff, so to speak. <laughs> We're moving in. We're moving in. Of course, you know, at that moment in time, there is no veil between the two regions, the two realms. Huh? We can go back and forth, I'm sure. Although the Lord doesn't actually reveal it and tell it to us, I'm sure we can go back and forth between the thrones that we have, ruling and reigning with Christ Jesus on this earth and the new Jerusalem that's in the heavenly realm. Ooh, my goodness. 
I cannot wait. It is a culture that you cannot even begin to imagine. And it is so beautiful. It goes beyond any culture, any, any great uh, period of time in the history of humanity, times the eternal glory of God's divine presence in heaven. I'm a, I, I, I pray that you'll see heaven. you long for heaven. You'll see the realms of God, the culture of the kingdom of God. You'll fall in love with the culture of the kingdom of God. You won't be swayed by all of the lies and deceptions of the powers of darkness that would try to, to draw you into the kingdoms of this world. You know, if you walk, follow me on Facebook, you saw this morning that, you know, I, I put on Facebook that the, the, that there, the smoke of their destruction and shall ascend up before the throne of God forever. Because the Lord is going to cast into hell, into a place of eternal torment, those who receive or who participate in the, uh, the satanic worship. Satan's been wanting to be worshipped for a long time. And he gets worshipped right now. People think it was just about the mark of the beast. There's going to be a real mark. But people take it every day. People, I see people all over the place tattooed with the spirit of the world, under the spirit of disobedience. Huh? They're already tattooed, they're tattooed in the heart, they're tattooed in the spirit. So, I mean, I, you know, I want people to grasp heaven. I want people to grasp the events that are taking place so that you are living in expectation. We're supposed to be those who are watching for the return of our Lord. Somebody said to me too recently, they said, don't you think it's going to be quite a time yet before the Lord Jesus comes? I said, well, from a, from a landscape of prophecy, yeah, I would say that that's probably true. But you know what? The Lord told me very clearly. He said, watch. Be ready because you don't know the hour. You don't know the time. I'm as one going on a far journey. And I'm going to return at a time, you know, that no one knows. So be, be faithful servants, always watching for when your Lord shall return. Because you don't know whether he's going to come in the morning or at the noon, uh, right? Or in the evening hour. Uh, you're not doing that in the tribulation. There's, God identifies 144,000 that are his, and that's it. And the 12,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel, guess what? We're in the 70th week. What's that about? It's about who? It's about Israel and the holy city. 70 weeks are determined upon Israel and the holy city. See that right there? That shows the time period of the time of the Gentiles. I disagree with, with Larkin on putting the time of the Gentiles right there at the end. The time of the Gentiles, as far as I'm concerned, ends right there, and I have proofs for it. I'm not going to bicker with them on it. I understand why he does that. I understand why Dake does it. I understand why other scholars do it. I end the time of the Gentiles right there. And I've got several reasons for why I do that and proofs for why I do it. Because, uh, and, you know, they're just simply, they're, it's, it's, not about, it's not about Gentiles being saved. I don't see the gospel going forth to the nations. I see the nations in total, total, as total apostates wanting nothing to do with God. There is no more harvest. It is, the harvest is past. And now God the, ends the age, the age of the church. The age of the church is removed. The age of grace is removed. It is removed. It is removed. A man of sin cannot be revealed until the hinderer of iniquity, which Paul is very clearly referring to the church, is removed. He, the, the, the one that holds back, people say, oh, we're going to get in there, man, and we're going to be the man invested sons, and we're going to do some serious damage. Hold up. Satan comes down out of heaven to be worshipped, and God gives him power over the saints. And the only blessed is, blessing is, blessed are you who die in the Lord. And you're going to have to get killed to be a part of the first resurrection. There's two companies. There's two companies of people now that come out of the tribulation. The two companies of people that come out of the tribulation are those who are martyred for the, for the Lord Jesus Christ, which then we see them go up right here. See that other arrow I got? And that's where the first, that's the end of the first resurrection. And that's what I just opened up reading right there in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. It has nothing to do with the church. Go back and read it again. It has nothing to do with the church age. It has nothing to do with the dead in Christ. Now I'm going to finish. So I'm going to say that. I'm going to say it again to you. I'm going to say it a couple of times to you so that you know that Revelation 24 has nothing to do with any resurrection of the righteous 
How many? <laughs> where do the righteous begin? Where do the righteous begin? Abel. Adam was not even named. It begins with Abel. From the blood of Abel, the righteous Abel. <laughs> right? That's where it begins. All the Old Testament saints are part of the New Jerusalem. They're going to be part of the resurrection. So that's what so this is what Paul says here. Look here with me back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He said, For this I say unto you by the word of the Lord, that ye which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Who's asleep? That's everybody's already dead. Grandpa all the way back to great, 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 great aunt. You know, Adam. Uh, um, Adam. Or Abel. Right. Are you with me? Yes. There it is. See then? For the Lord himself shall descend uh, right after the tribulation. And the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Well, where's that in the book of tribulation? In the, in, the, in the book of Revelation, during the tribulation? It doesn't exist. Somebody said, well, you know, in the seven trumps, the seven trumpets, they're cursings. They're the outpouring of God's wrath. They're the woes. And the only thing that you can see during the trumpets the only event that you can see happen during the trumpets is what? Of someone getting snatched away is what? Come on, folks. Don't be afraid. The 144,000 snatched up. That's it. And somebody said, well, that's the whole church. But then you and Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> it's not an allegory. It's virtuous men who have not known women. For, I mean, you can't get more specific. Remember, it's back to this whole thing. See, what happens is if you look at Daniel, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, what did Daniel see? He, it's like he saw it all right together, didn't he? He saw that, there would, that everyone who, was, who laid in the dust, they should be raised from the dead, some to the resurrection of life, some to the resurrection of damnation. Huh? You see that? He's got like got them sandwiched together like they were right together. But we get more information. We got the book of Revelation. Ha! We got, ha, 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 look at that. Hey, eh? The Lord shows us, wait a minute. There's a thousand years apart from each other. Wow, that's, that's taking a verse of scripture and bringing a whole lot more detail in it. And so prophecy builds that way. There's insight. I, you, what will happen if you will create, okay, whew, whew, I'm getting a little drunk. If you keep reading through the Word of God, you'll discover how that, you, how that God will integrate the past and the present and the future. And you'll begin to get real comfortable with the prophetic style, and then you can pull out, oh, they're talking about Jesus right there. Oh, they're talking about the, you know, this event or that event. So, here we are. Is, I want you to go and a, a, answer this question. During the trumpet judgments, this is not a trumpet judgment. This is, a, this is not a trumpet. It's Jesus. Huh? With the voice of an archangel and the sound of, the, of, a, of a trumpet. Is there any place that you can actually legitimately make this fit in the book of Revelation? And I'm going to give you a clue. You're going to have to try to do it sometime between 12 and 14. Oh, I'll stretch it out to 15. But then I can't stretch it out to 15 because if you stretch it out to 15, then you definitely are in chapter 15. You're definitely in the category uh, of tribulation martyrs. So somebody said, how long is the first resurrection? How long is the first resurrection? Well, it's been about 2,000 years right now. See that line right there? It's that red line. Started with Jesus and some of the saints that came out of the grave. Then here's the big one. Jesus shall, Jesus shall come with a shout with the voice of an archangel, and here we are. It says that he shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, okay? And the dead in Christ shall rise first. When we begin to talk about the catching away, and people say there is no catching away, where they really, really mess up bad is they don't recognize that the catching away is the first resurrection it's a, it is the bigger part of the first resurrection. And to touch the catching away, you're touching the resurrection. And you better be very careful because there's lots of warnings on that. 
So this is the event when the dead in Christ shall rise first. When does that happen in the, Revela in the book of Revelation? It doesn't happen. It doesn't take place. It does not take place. Period. Therefore, it has to take place before the book of Revelation. Before, somehow before the things of chapter 4. Before the metatauto. Write the things which you have seen. Write the things which are. And write the things which shall be hereafter. If it doesn't, if the resurrection doesn't take place, the big resurrection, what we would call the great resurrection, if the dead in Christ shall, are not found here, raising up from the dead anywhere, because reality of it is, is the marriage supper of the Lamb happens somewhere in here before Christ returns. So the resurrected saints have to be here in heaven for the judgment seat of Christ, the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then the return of Christ Jesus with all of his resurrected saints. Where is that going to happen? If it isn't in the book of Revelation, if it isn't in chapter 4 to chapter 19, then it, it has to happen before chapter 4. Is it that logical? Is, the, is, is that not something sensible and reasonable? Why should we wrestle the scripture to our own destruction just because somebody got some grandiose idea? They're not living right now, and somehow they're going to live right in the future? Give me a break. You not live it. Listen, everybody's got their head down. You know what the kill zone is? The kill zone is if you go into the kill zone, you're going to die, right? The military defines kill zone, right? If you go into that area, you're going to get killed. It, the whole of the tribulation is kill zone. Everybody's got their head down. Oh, we're going to be evangelizing. <laughs> that is funny. The only way you could be is if you got sealed so none of all of the disasters and the demon locusts and all the crazy outpouring of God's wrath against sin and iniquity couldn't touch you. And God's going to get the ones he sealed out of the way before he does the, the, the bold judgments because, my goodness, it is going to be so intense that who can stand there's no more mountains you talk about you talk about earthquakes you talk about volcanoes you talk about the most intense things people in the bowl judgments is going to be so black dark because god's going to demand that every light quit shining on the earth that they will they will chew their tongues off out of pain hey that's why the hundred forty four thousand are out of there I want people to, somebody said, oh, this happened during, you know, there's a lot of people there that, that believe that the, the millennial reign of Christ started in 70 AD. I'm like, you have, that's now the, 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 the two millennial reign of Christ. Are you kidding me? I mean, if you just listed the disasters that are going to take place just under the seven, the seven seals, six seals, and then the seventh that opens up the twelve. The, the, the seven trumpets and the seventh trumpet that opens up the seven bowl judgments. You realize that it's another earth by the end of time, by the end that this is, by the end of this event. It's another, it's, a, it's, <laughs> the earth isn't the same. There's no more mountains. Every living thing in the, in the sea has been killed. All the waters have been dried up are their blood. When did that happen in the past 2,000 years? It didn't happen. Give me a break. Oh, it's symbolism. Symbolism. Oh, it is. Well, then you, would you please tell me what that symbolism means? And now silence for the space of the rest of their life. Oh, it's a mystery. No, it's not a mystery. Reveal, revelation means to reveal. To unveil the mystery. The mystery is now unveiled. It was a mystery in Daniel 12 too. It's not a mystery here. Huh? It was a mystery... It was a mystery by the prophets in Zechariah. It's not a mystery here. It was a mystery in Obadiah. It's not a mystery here. It's a mystery in Ezekiel. not a mystery here. The mystery in Isaiah. not a mystery here. Hmm? Okay. So, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. See this? Can you see that? We. Listen, Paul. And all you guys who are alive then, he's not saying that. We. Paul was in, he believed he was going to be alive at the catching of the way. There's, there's many evidence, there's much evidence for this. We, we're going up. He didn't say, 
after we get finished with the mark of the beast and going through all of that and we're done with that business and the antichrist is finished everybody watch out the antichrist is about to come i think he's nero paul didn't say any of those things he wasn't ridiculous <laughs> with these things as we are he just always talking about the coming of jesus he didn't show a block between the coming of Jesus and, an ant, and going through the tribulation. I'm glad, because I don't want to go through the tribulation. Oh, you a coward. Say what you will. <laughs> Say what you will. I'd rather be at the judgment seat of Christ. When will the judgment seat of Christ take place? It's one of my, one of my 10 questions. When does it take place? As nobody can answer that. Who believes that the church is going through the tribulation? Because everybody knows it has to take place before the induction. When does the marriage supper of the Lamb take place? Well, then you got some folks that say, well, here's what's going to happen. We're going to go up in a twinkling of an eye at the very end of it all. Dead in Christ are going to rise, even though you don't see that. There's just a whole bunch of make-believe here. The very end of the tribulation, then... The dead in Christ are going to rise from the grave. And then we're going to, we which are alive and remain, shall be changed in a moment and twinkling of an eye. Is that ludicrous? I can't even bring myself to say it. <laughs> because I got, I'm being hit with so many hundreds of scriptures to go. I'm thinking once again, how do people climb over top of all of this? How could you possibly believe that all of a sudden at the very end of the tribulation, at the very number of days, and we know the total number of days, that all of a sudden we're going to go up and in a day, one day, in one day we're going to go up and we're going to have the judgment seat of Christ and we're going to have the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's going to be a fast meal. And then we're going to turn <laughs> right around and poof, we're going to come right back down. Jesus said, I go away to prepare a place for you. And if I go away, I'll come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there, may, there you may be also. Where he is. So he's, there is an event in which Christ Jesus comes to get us, to receive us unto himself, which is right there at this point that just before the things which shall be hereafter begin. Just before God begins to deal with his, the final week that is determined upon the people of Israel and the holy city. So, this scripture says we should meet him in the air. You're going to tell me that that beautiful, glorious event, how many is that? How many, how many folks is that? <laughs> Hallelujah. Look here. We're not talking about a bunch of little spirits, you know, little miniature spirits. Smaller than molecules floating around. We're talking about people got their resurrected bodies. Somebody said, what does that look like? Just like Jesus. He said, touch me. When he sat down and made fish and he had fish and honey with him so that they could quit being afraid of him and said, look, you know, touch me, fill me. Hand on me. The resurrected body. How many folks are going to be there? The dead in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive and remain. Come on, that's got to be a great company of people. It is. It's more than anyone can number that have come out of great tribulation and have made their garments white in the blood of the, the Lamb, which is one, the, one of the chief companies that you see at the very beginning, already in heaven. 24 elders standing there in heaven, clearly the representative of all saints. The, the, uh, the great innumerable company of saints have made, washed their blood, have washed their garments in the blood of Jesus, standing there with the victory symbol of the palm branch, the, the only other company. The martyrs cannot, they have to stay under the altar. They're not seen until the parenthetical statement of, 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 of Revelation chapter 15. And then they're not fully brought into view until Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. Revelation 20, verse 4. Think about it. I want you to go and think about it. I want you to go make yourself some timelines. I want you to wrestle with this. Say, Pastor, please. You already got a street in the Bible an hour a day. <laughs> Why do you think time grows on trees? We got things to do. We got, we got fish to fry. 
We know that you're a hard <laughs> and relentless man. Reaping where you have not sown, gathering where you've not laid up. We had other business to take care of, other things important, so we took that which is yours and we wrapped it in a napkin and we held it here in the earth so that you may have that which is yours when you return. Of course, say, you wicked servant. I'm not letting anybody under my watch be some wicked servant. Huh? You may just want to sit around and laugh and feel good. I'm going to tell you, get to work. Hey, Amen. Hey, listen, you listen to me. In Jesus' name. I command you to listen to me. Go to, second, go to 1 Corinthians, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, real quick. Once again, I'm just giving highlights because I'm trying to get this done in an hour. I probably already used up all my time. <laughs> and this is an overview. This is intro 101. This is not, this is not 110. This is not 210. This is not 310. This is not 410. This is not advanced studies. Okay? I've got advanced studies. Believe you me, I've got advanced studies in this because I've spent a, a, a good part of my life. I mean, I had these... I had all these charts when I was a little guy. I, you know, take Dake, Dake's chart, which he got from Larkin, and just go through the thing. Because I heard Dake minister so many times because my mom and Dake's daughter find that Dake were best friends. Dake it was a very close part of our life. Another man I call Uncle Charles to this day, Tim Allen, he was here ministering in the church last year. His dad, it was Dake's primary confidant, theologian involved in his work. And so, I mean, I said, listen to this all my life. But I don't believe it because I listened to it all my life. But I'm not going to be an idiot and not build on it. Are you with me? Yes. Huh? Have I looked at it and said, no, you know, I'm going to try to disprove this? Yeah. You know, I've tried to disprove that I'm saved. I can't do it. Are you listening to me? Yeah. I tried to find a convincing argument that, I, that I'm the one exception that can't be born again. <laughs> 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 Come on, people, get with the program. You know, I, I, I was talking to a friend the other day because I have one of his books in my, in my house that belonged to him. And uh, he, he, the guy built, built probably the biggest, he built the biggest biotech company. D Dr. David Cohn built the biggest biotech company in the world in, in DNA diagnostics. And, you know, and um, he's got, he's very, very wealthy several houses. You know what he does? He lives in a lab 18 hours a day. He's got a cot. He's got a little cot. He just always, Dr. Dave's always over his bench top working on some other experiment. He's devoted to the cause. My, what, what would it look? I'm devoted to the cause. I'm bent over top of this going, what on earth? No, it's not on earth. It's in heaven. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, so 1 Corinthians chapter 50. Come on, get with the program. This, is, this, is, this, has, got, this has got eternal reward. Oh, what, what, you need to eat some more? What, what, you need some more toys to play with? Forget about it. It's going to get burned up. Your house is going to be demoed. Everything you got in this earth is going to melt, melt with a fervent heat. I'm, 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 I'm laying up treasure in heaven, man. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the, you know, to the Lord about my interior decoration. Um, Amen. You know what I'm saying. I'm going to get too carried away. Verse 51. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I like this pointer. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. <clears throat> I know I kind of tripped you up there. 1 Corinthians chapter, of course, I'm always thinking about the gifts of the Spirit. <laughs> I'm always thinking about the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. You know, I, I tell you, I just get provoked listening to these people on television, you know, that I know, them, I know they've been caught in adultery already because I, I got the inside scoop and then they're up there acting like some kind of expert telling people about all this stuff and I just want to call fire down out of heaven. But we're not allowed to do that. And here they're telling all this lies and nonsense is not true and they're telling us that they understand the... the, the, the they understand the end time prophecy and they got an inside scoop and they don't they have enough ability to stay, keep their zipper up. I'm hoping they're watching me on this YouTube right now. So I don't want to hear nothing they got to say. And I get so provoked. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. <laughs> I get so provoked. I'm telling you. I, can you tell? I, pro, I get provoked. I'm like, we're gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some YouTube to get the Bible out here, make sure everybody that I can have any impact on recognizes that this is nonsense they're telling. 
This is lies. They feed in the flesh of men. Huh? A bunch of cannibals eating raw flesh of men. Flesh doctrine from a fleshly source. I better be careful. I'm going to get carried away here. Turn into a prophet. An angry prophet. <laughs> Behold. I love the promises of God. I believe that we must have faith. There must be faith in the resurrection. Paul said, if by any means possible, I might attain unto the resurrection. And somebody said, we, we need to go through the tribulation to be tried. What, does grandpa got to be raised from the dead to go through the tribulation to be tried? That's nonsense. Hello. This is the period of time. There comes a time when no man can work. It's not now. The tribulation is a time when no man can work. And there's supernatural, miraculous interaction going on with one company of people in the book of Revelation from Revelation 4 to 19. And that is Israel. And that's it. That's it. And the church is absent, absolutely absent, not mentioned. Absent. And so people have to just deal with the reality of it. Because, and the more important thing, I don't see why people want to have faith to go through the tribulation. What on earth is wrong with your head? You want to be tortured? <laughs> you want to incur the wrath of God when the Lord said, made promise after promise after promise that he would keep us from his wrath? Isaiah 26 said so. He would keep us from his wrath. That there would be, that there would be a, a, a gathering unto him before his wrath was poured out, even Isaiah declared that. Why do people, I mean, I want you to have faith in the resurrection. I want you to have faith in Bolsta Carone, Bolus Peronisi, being counted worthy to stand before the Son of Man and escape all these things which have come upon the earth. This is the wrath of God. It's not the blessing of God. It's the wrath of God. Wrath of God for what? Wrath of God poured out. People prophesy, look, it's just gone too, it's gotten too bad. It's like Sodom and Gomorrah. God's wrath's going to pour out upon it. Get ready, everybody. Leave quickly. You know, you've got these prophets that believe they're going to go through the tribulation. Tell them folks out here on the West Coast, don't wait for God to tell you. Only stay if he tells you to stay. Otherwise, Go. Because the wrath of God's about to be poured out. There's going to be a great earthquake and yada, yada, yada. Well, why don't you put that over in the book of Revelation, man? Why don't you get us all delivered so we don't go through the wrath of God there? Because that's really the wrath of God. That's when the wrath, God's wrath, the wrath is deferred until that moment. And it's his wrath poured out upon sin and iniquity. Is it an about? Now, listen. We're going to preach to you and minister to you. Here you're being carried away by Sennacherib. He's ripping apart your wife, ripped your child out, cut its head off, got you by the nap of the head, parent carrying you into, into, into bondage and saying, now would you please repent and come back to know me? You're under the wrath. There's no coming back to know him. There's no repentance now. There's no way out now. And that's what people want to try to say is going on in the, in the tribulation. It's nonsense, man. It's God giving it over. It's done. It's judgment now. It's wrath now. It's indignation now. It's God's got his nose flared out. Because that's what anger means in the Hebrew. In, to flare up your nose. You're done. Father, it's a good thing that he is long-suffering. He's slow to anger. But when it comes, watch out. Because he is as ferocious in his wrath and as intense in his wrath as he is in his love. And he doesn't have, he don't have any in-betweens. Hallelujah. It's going to be full-blown love or it's full-blown wrath. That's who he is. Read some more. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> There's no intercessor. 
Oh, every, all the water's blood, and everybody's going, praise God. <laughs> you make them drink blood, Papa. Make them drink blood. They killed your servants. Now make them drink the blood that they poured out. No intercession. Oh, Lord, have mercy. No, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> okay. Hallelujah. I'm going to be excited the whole time. The whole time of tribulation, I'm going to be eating. I'm going to be eating much. I'm going to have my, I'm going to get my rewards first because the Lord's going to get that out of the way so we won't have stomach ache. You know, you can't sit down and eat and enjoy it if there's, if there's pending, you know, judgment coming down, problems. The Lord's going to get it all out of the way. We all going to know where we're at. We're going to be all thankful that we're included. Then we're going to sit down and we're going to have the marriage supper. We're going to be married to him. Ooh. Just try to think about what that means. And then we're going to judge angels and men for all, for all eternity. Amazing. Amazing. Behold, to show you a mystery, you should not all die or sleep. It's one of the ways to refer to death. It's not soul, sleep, body, sleep, nothing else. It's just it's another way to refer to death. You should not all die or sleep, but you should be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump, trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now understand, Paul took his message to the church at Corinth, which was earlier on. He expounded, same author. He expounded it in later years to the church at Thessalonica. And he made it more specifically clear that this trumpet was the Lord descending with the voice of an archangel, Christ Jesus coming himself. Coming to receive us unto himself, as he promised, that where he is, we may be with him also. I hope that that isn't really bending your mind to be able to put all that together. I hope that makes real plain and simple sense. I know if you were like counting on going through the tribulation, I'm really, you know, I'm, I'm raining on your parade, man. <laughs> but it ain't going to be no parade. It's just not going to be a parade. Now it's time, time to live big for God. Now we, got, now we, can, we, can, step in, we can step into all the fullness of his glory right now, right now, right now. You have to get a doctrine. You have to get a doctrine of the manifested sons because this is built on the doctrine of the manifested sons. I know. Because I know who built the doctrine personally. You got to believe that all the fullness of the manifest power of the Lord Jesus Christ cannot be expressed in the midst of the church until the tribulation. But yet you still, after having believed that, you still have no way to do that unless now you marry British Israelism with it and make us all different members of a, a tribe. But then you're going to have to spiritualize 12,000. Because the rest of you are going to be left out because I'm certainly included. And you're going to get 12,000 people like that real quick, right? And, so, and then that means there's only 144,000. Unless you're going to make that somehow symbolic. And then there's no end to it. Then let's just make everything else symbolic too. And we're in heaven right now. But we're not going to do that. Amen. There's no sin. Every symbolism in the scripture is revealed. If you don't understand these parables, how then shall you understand all parables? And so the Lord Jesus makes known to us his, his usage of symbolism. John didn't really need to. Because Daniel had already done the job. John, John takes and expands out things in more detail that Daniel just left to numbers of days. And now John brings out the details of what it's going to look like. And that's just really important for you to understand that and build on that. For the corruptible must put on incorruption and the mortal must put on immortality. Okay? Let me just put up that other... <coughs> Put up this other slide real quick. 
This is a, this is a pure Larkin chart. And uh, you can see what Larkin did as he made the times of the Gentiles, which is Luke chapter 21, uh, like verse 34. He made the times of the Gentiles extending um, at least from the time of Daniel's day all the way to the end of the Antichrist, uh, in the Antichrist kingdom. What he does here is he shows, first and foremost, he shows the period beginning right here with Daniel. He shows uh, the period of time where John comes announcing the kingdom. Uh, the king is rejected. The death of the Lord Jesus Christ is ascension. <clears throat> his priesthood of the king. While on earth is the church functioning. He, he calls it kingdom postponed. I understand why you say that, but I, I don't really look at it as kingdom postponed, but it is kingdom postponed in view of this, the millennial reign of Christ. And, and um, then he shows here at the end of uh, the priesthood of the king, he shows the return of the king with the saints. And other, other charts that you would see him and other theologians contemporary with him, that he would put right here the judgment seat of Christ. <clears throat> Christ, he'd put the marriage supper of the Lamb and immediately the return of all resurrected saints, because this is it. Here now we come to set up the kingdom. And, um, I'm sorry, I, I'm pointing over here talking about this. So it is, it's actually here. So here, here, here's, <clears throat> here's the king coming to receive his church in the air. He doesn't come to the earth. Notice that First Thessalonians chapter 4, there's a bunch of different points there. First, chapter, first Thessalonians chapter 4 really brings that out. So there's the judgment seat of Christ, there's the marriage supper of the Lamb. He's showing just before the return. The Lord Jesus comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment. And of course, ten thousands of his saints, literally, literally it's, it's uh, thousands and thousands. It's myriads and myriads. So it's, it's, that's a huge number. Okay? He comes with myriads and myriads of his saints to execute judgment upon all the ungodly for the ungodly deeds which they've ungodly committed. That's the battle of Armageddon, the destruction of the kingdoms which goes, harkens back to Daniel's vision, which we've been over and over again. And at this advent, at the destruction of the Antichrist's uh, armies, um, of course, which, you know, Satan, right, Satan is cast down right here at the middle, and Satan becomes uh, a big part of this, more than what people even teach or talk about, which I've alluded to in some of the studies, but haven't gone into a lot of depth or detail on it. Happy to do that in the future with you. And um, the, the most important things that you've got to begin to, to, to address, and I'm going to go over them one more time, just in conclusion, because when he comes, he sets up the eternal kingdom. It's, it, it, there's no revelation of back and forth. It's just he comes, sets up the kingdom. We're ruling and reigning with Christ. And, um, but what you, what you really got to deal with is, the most important things that you've got to begin to deal with is, when does the judgment seat of Christ take place? When did the marriage supper of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ take place? Seeing as that has to happen before Jesus returns with his resurrected saints to earth to fight the Arma, battle of Armageddon, which is the very end of the seven-year tribulation, to set up the eternal kingdom. Okay, and back to the first slide. And the other thing that you have to address is how, how expansive can the 70th week be in terms of being incorporating other nations when uh, Daniel has very clearly focused in for us on what the 70 weeks are all about. Why is the church hidden in the 70 weeks? Why isn't it revealed? And there's, of course, answers to all of these questions. And then I would say probably one of the easiest questions to ask yourself is, what is the purpose of the church in the tribulation? Okay, if, what would be the purpose of the church during the tribulation? What would be the purpose of this, of this congregation and every congregation with the mandate to go? And our, our mandate is this, be endued with power from on high. This is our commission, okay? Be endued with power from on high and go and preach the gospel to every creature as a witness, okay, to all nations. Okay, this gospel of the kingdom to every creature. And of course, you know, I'm marrying verses of scripture when I'm saying this. Okay, and, in the, and that is with total authority over the devil, with total authority over the devil, cast out devils, okay, heal the sick, right? Proclaim liberty to the captives. How do you even begin to think of doing that in the tribulation 
when Satan has authority over the saints. There's no more authority of saints over Satan. We live in a different administration. Right now we have all authority over Satan. Okay, you understand that? Tread upon scorpions and serpents and over all the power of the enemy. And, and nothing can by any means hurt us. Do you understand that? We, we say go and they have to go. They have to obey. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name. You'll cast out devils. The Lord Jesus said, I have all authority in heaven and earth. Go now. Jesus sitting in the seat, head over all principalities, powers, and might, and dominion, telling us to go and do his work, which is to destroy the works of the devil. Okay? How does that even begin to fit and work in the context of the tribulation? Okay? Okay, I'm done. So, any questions? Okay, questions? We're good, I see your hands pop up. Everybody's not shocked tonight. Yeah. It, and of course, I wasn't being literal with that. I was just being, I was just using that in a symbolic, spiritual way. Because he's the God of this world. He's the spirit of disobedience. Go ahead. No, no. It, let me just say, let me say that the rise of the seventh kingdom begins at the beginning of the first part of the seven years. The rise of the seventh kingdom and, 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 and its dominion as the seventh kingdom lasts for three and a half years. At the end of the three and a half years, the whore, which has been associated, which is, is the religion of Nimrod, which has impacted all of the kingdoms, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Greece, Rome, all of those, that religion is destroyed. Why? Because now the beast religion takes begins to begins to uh, come come to view. So the whore is removed. The beast that she rides upon is the eighth. You remember that, Revelation chapter seventeen. It's during the last three and a half years, during the beast, what we call the beast kingdom or the eighth kingdom. Um, Satan is now cast out of heaven. He comes to the earth having great wrath. He comes to be worshipped. It is there in that specific context in the last part of the seven-year tribulation that the Luciferian occult of Satan demanding to be worshipped where he goes to gather all humanity to worship him, similar to what Nimrod did, similar to what Alexander the Great did. I mean, it goes on. I mean, some of these things and proofs I've already set forth for you in the previous studies. But, it is only during that time that this elusive, which could mean a number of different things, but this elusive branding takes place. Back in antiquity, if you were a slave, you were actually branded. You were, you were to receive a mark belonging to that household, similar to what we do with cattle. Satan has purposed to brand all humanity. And it is within that context that you can't buy or sell without the brand. Um, then the, the next big question is, <clears throat> how widespread is that impact? Is he able to, uh, in that particular circumstance, impact the world? <coughs> Let me just say this. Ezekiel says that they will be gathering the weapons of the warfare for seven years. They will not need to cut wood from the forest for seven years because of the wood <coughs> that they get from the weaponry. So we're talking about major shifts here, sociologically, politically, major shifts. We're talking about primitive weapons, shields being made of wood. That's, that's very primitive because he says shield and buckler used for firewood. Spears, arrows, bows. It's not the same system that we have right now. It's not, it's, and, and, and of course, we know that even as since the Noah's flood, civilization began and rose up in, in Babylon under the 
leadership of Nimrod, that's where it ends. It becomes the ruling capital of the world. So how expansive is that? Well, he's got basically three and a half years to get it done. How many people did Hitler kill? Hitler's the face of Satan. Hitler's the face of an antichrist. How many people did Hitler get killed? How many did he round, 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 round? Because it, it's a pretty good type because he's, he's busy doing war. Antichrist is going to be busy doing war. Because in the middle of three and a half years, he comes up with, he's already gotten, <clears throat> he, he plucked up three of the horns, Assyria. The Assyrian plucked up three of the horns, Greece, Turkey, and, and Egypt. The other six of the ten that is represented both by Daniel and in the book of Revelation, those other six kingdoms give their power to the Antichrist. <clears throat> so now he has all ten kingdoms. Now remember, this makes up all of Europe. Six kingdoms making up all of Europe. That's why we know that there will be a great third world war before this happens. Six kingdoms. Try to divide all of Europe into six kingdoms right now. The six kings, six kingdoms, okay? And we understand the implement of it because Paul showed us the terrible beast, Roman Empire, and he showed a connectivity, the Roman Empire, out of it came ten horns. And out of one of the horns came the little horn, which is the one that makes the abomination, that makes desolate, the very earmark of the Antichrist. Without question, everybody agrees, cross the board. No question about it. <clears throat> so we know what four of them are. We don't know... And we know the landscape of the Roman Empire, okay, what it looked like. So we know that that's all of Europe. And uh, so he's going to now go in the middle of the, of the 70th week, he's going to try to destroy Israel. He comes down to destroy him. That's when he goes into the holies of holies, says, I'm God. That's when they know he's not the Messiah. That's when they flee. That's when they break the covenant. See, they got a covenant with him. And they got a covenant of peace because they look at him as the Prince of Peace. And there's been all kinds of strange and crazy ideas thought about this, but they see him as the Messiah. Jesus said, I come unto you, you receive me not. Another one who's not your own you shall come, and him you shall receive. And he's talking about the Antichrist, the man of sin. They're going to say, you're the Messiah. He's going to come as the man of peace. He looks like it. Are you with me? Are you tracking with me here? Then he's going to hear rumor of the kings of the north. And he's going to go battle him. And he's got, a big, he's got a big undertaking going on there because that would be whatever part of Russia that wasn't involved in the, six, uh, in the, in the uh, other six kingdoms. He's got then all of the kingdoms of the east and we see the growing empire there, China, India, and the rest. <laughs> he's got a lot to do, right? He's going to bring all of them, right? Because in the, uh, what is it? Is it the sixth bowl or is it the fifth bowl? Dries up the Euphrates to make way for the kings of the east to be able to come gather themselves. He drinks all nations. Gog then gets all Magog, which is all the nations. Magog means all nations. Magog is not a person. Has no genealogy. And so I, I, I just want to erase that for you. That doesn't exist. I hope everybody hears this. If you want to write me, www.abidingplace.com and be happy to discuss it with you and give you lots of proofs, not just mine, uh, we just take any, you choose the theologian, you know, pick a number, win a prize. And we'll, we'll, we'll establish that for you. Just have everybody see that that's, that is the truth. <clears throat> but what I, my point I was making is that so many people get all carried away about the mark of the beast. Oh, it's the credit card. Oh, the credit card wasn't it. Now it's going to be a chip and whatever. No, reality of it is that's nonsense. It's for the last three and a half years of tribulation. It will be clearly connected with falling down and worshiping Lucifer and saying, Lucifer, I want you to be God and I do not want God, Yehovah, to be God. I don't want Jesus Christ to be God. It will be on that level. You must understand. It will be a renouncing, like, you know, ISIS is wanting you to renounce Christianity and accept Islam. It will be a renouncing of God and acceptance of Lucifer on that level. Now, I want you to hear clearly what I'm saying here. Okay, then I, I got to get these other questions. Hear clearly what I'm saying. He's already wanting, he's, he's never quit wanting to be worshipped since Isaiah 14. He never wanted to quit worship, try to overthrow God. Jesus said, I saw him cast down his lightning to the ground. It happened before. It happened before the garden. It happened, and the result of that was a complete chaos of the earth, and that's why the earth became Tahu Baba, Tahu 
vababahu, which is to become in desolate and empty in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Okay? So he's always wanting to be worshipped. People worship him now. You worship him with sin. You worship him and participating in his iniquity. There is no greater worship in Satan than sexual immorality. And God makes it clear and he makes it so. There's no way to bind yourself more to the demonic than sexual immorality. No way. No way. It's far worse than sitting in a pentagram and asking devils to come and possess you. And God made it clear over and again from Genesis all the way through. Okay? I saw other hands go up. Let me try to forget. I'm terrible at answering questions quickly. Um, so in the... <clears throat> And still they would not repent. Yeah. Right. So like is it true that some people repented? Like, well, listen, know? listen. It's God's dealing it's 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 Romans chapter 11, God bringing back Israel. It's the time of Israel. It's the receiving back in. It's them re being received back in. Where do you find a time period of where Israel is received back in? The veil is taken away, okay? That is initiated with the 144,000, clearly. You see 144,000 evangelists raised up. Who are they raised up for? The house of Israel. Who, what, has, what has Israel been called since the days of Abraham? Saints. See, what happens, we think saints are belongs to, is a term that belongs to people who are Christians. No. It belongs to God's people, God's covenant people. Israel, the nation of Israel has been being called saints. The people of Israel have been being called saints since Abraham. So it's not about the nations. It's not about the nation. The time of the Gentiles is finished. When the time, when the catching away, when the church is taken away, we are the evangelists. We are the ones to go to all the nations. Jesus was sent to Israel. To no other nation, just Israel. He said, you guys go, go to all the nations. After the nations have been evangelized, then the end shall come. Okay? And what, the end of what? The end of the church age. So when you look at saints, you know, you, you say, well, can somebody possibly be saved? Well, let me just say this. You've got, you know, like, like the scripture says in Zechariah, you've got one third of Egypt, one third of Assyria, you've got all these various different folks coming out of the tribulation as natural human beings. And the people of the island of the sea will say, will say to them, God is in our midst. Come up with us to worship him. Huh? <laughs> so there's a lot of people left alive. Well, there are a number of people left alive. I mean, you, there's people are just wiped out. Look at it. Total up the total amount of people that are taken out, beginning with the first, with, with the uh, beginning with the uh, fifth seal, starting the fifth seal. Take title up total amount of people wiped out on the face of the earth. Look at the conditions in which they're in. Okay, you got no you got you got no no moon no sun no stars shining at various different intervals of time throughout the tribulation. That's extremely cold. You got you got situations where no one can grow anything. I mean, how do you grow something? How do you grow something? We got demon locusts flying around, stinging you, <laughs> and all kinds of other things going on. War and havoc and upheaval. Okay, it's really about. It's really about. I don't believe anybody but Israel is going to be saved as part of the first resurrection saints. You understand what I mean? Saved to be a part of the first resurrection, to have an immortal body, to be a part of the first resurrection. To receive a glorified body like Jesus. None. Except for Israel. They're, it's their, Israel's opportunity to be a part of the first resurrection. They're blinded. There's a, blind, there's, a, there's a spirit of blindness on them right now. Because of their iniquity and because of their sin and because of their rebellion. The Lord's going to remove it. Romans chapter 11. There's going to be a time of receiving them back in. Okay? And this is all before the tribulation. This is during the tribulation. This is during the tribulation. Right. Right now... Before the tribulation, everybody that's going to be a part of the nations, including Israel, because there's many people over the years, you know, it was, it was God's people, Israel, who started the church. First century church was primarily Jewish people. 
And over the years, in every generation, there's been a population of Jewish people who recognize who the Messiah is. But this is for all nations. And everybody who died in Christ Jesus or who is alive when he returns shall be a part of the first resurrection. Then there's another company that's part of the first resurrection. is those who are killed, martyred, martyred. It's not, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I invite you to come. You've got to be killed, martyred to be a part of first resurrection. Very important point. Study it out. Prove it for yourself. There is nobody coming out of the tribulation, a part of the re resurrection, unless they are beheaded. Romans 20, verse 4. And it begins in Revelation chapter 6. And they're, they're underneath the altar, and after me there, cannot be seen, have to stay there and kept until all their brethren who are killed in like manner as they are killed. And that's what the Assyrians did. The Assyrians were headhunters. Every relief you'll see of a Syrian, they're carrying heads around. Baskets full of heads. That's what's the thing that they did. Okay, are you with me? You understand? There is no evidence, proof, period, at all that any Gentile will be saved, as we understand saved, during the time of the tribulation. However, I will leave room that they did not receive the mark of the beast, and that they, as a Gentile, one of the nations, was beheaded for the Lord Jesus Christ. Martyred for the Lord Jesus Christ. People can't stand up against a little, you know, stick demon that's blind in both eyes, deaf in both ears, mute, has an IQ of zero, and is, is a paraplegic. They can't stand against a demon like that. What are they going to do when the devil's listening with, with that kind of deception? Because he will go. He will go with such deception. He would deceive the kings of the earth with the signs and wonders and miracles. He will take you, man. He will take you. That deception. People think they're smarter than they really are. People think they have a stronger will than they really do. Every day your will is proven to you how strong. Your perceptions are continually being witness and testifying for you or against you of how accurate they are. People ain't going to make it. You're not going to make it. Give me a break. I've been pastoring 33 years. And nobody can make it in tribulation. You can't make it now. You ain't making it then. Huh? Not at that level. Satan has, Satan's been given power. It's like the Lord says, the Lord says you can just go this far. You can only be tempted, will not be tempted above what you're able. That's not so in the tri tribulation. He, as he removes the boundary. It's like taking the boundary. The waves come just so far. Almighty waves have to obey him. They come just so far because God set a boundary. The boundary is removed. And now, the, the, when the tide comes in, <laughs> it goes all the way up to Ramona and past. It goes into the it goes into the to the desert. It floods the earth. There's no boundary. There's no limitation. Are you with me? Did I answer your question? Yeah. So they don't repent as we know repentance, but they get beheaded. You, yeah. You got You're going to have to stand for Jesus. You're, if you're going to be a part of the first resurrection, you're going to get killed in the tribulation. Otherwise, you go through the tribulation. And if you were the, one, the lucky one who made it in your bunker, I'm just joking. I'm just joking with your lima beans, okay? Then you, then you get to go into the tribulation as a living human being. But you'll never be a part of the first resurrection. That company is sealed. The company of the first resurrection is sealed. When? At, before Jesus returns to the earth to set up the kingdom. Important point. When is the second Resurrection, which is for the dead, a thousand years later. Is there any other resurrection? Doesn't exist. Is there another part of the first resurrection? No. It closes before Jesus returns to the earth to fight the battle of Armageddon. It's closed. Important point. Just want everybody to understand that. The gathering up of the resurrected saints is the very salient point of argument for that the tribulation has no place or opportunity for such an event to take place. The only thing that happens during the tribulation is an additions made, as I was showing you those lines, additions are made for the martyrs of the tribulation to be included. And those martyrs, who do the martyrs end with? Come on. Who do they end with? Who's the last two martyrs? Enoch and Elijah. Okay. The, the two witnesses. Somebody said, can it be Moses? It can't be Moses. Moses' body was dead. That means he's got to be raised up from the dead as a natural human being. 
Not a resurrected saint. <laughs> There's two guys who haven't died. They were both end time prophets. Both of them thought that they were at the end. First one was Enoch. He prophesied God will come with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment on all the ungodly for the ungodly deeds which they've ungodly committed. That's a whole lot of ungodly. That's a serious prophet getting down, okay? He's coming. He's been in reserve for 5,000 years, been held back, right? And then the second prophet who really truly believed that he was living in the end time, prophesying the end time, when the Assyrian was come to destroy, uh, uh, the nation of Israel would destroy the earth as well and would advance the kingdom of God. The Lord calls in and realized, no, you're going to have to wait. He, he, was, he had it in him. He was, he was an end time prophet. Well, he is. The Lord had to put him on hold for 2,700 years. Those two are coming back. And so Israel today sets a place for Elijah to return. Guess what they're going to think? They're going to think that the false prophet is Elijah. He's going to do what Elijah did. He's going to call fire out of heaven. He's going to deceive many. He's going to deceive many of Israel. Many of Israel will go ahead and accept the Messiah as God. Only the discerning, only the, only the devout will say he's not the Messiah. He's making himself God. He cannot be. And then they'll flee. Well, he'll, take, he'll take a lot of Israel out. Especially with the activity of the uh, false prophet who actually rises up right at that time. Because he looks just like Elijah. He fits Elijah perfect. He does miracles, calls fire down out of heaven. He's Elijah. He's everything. You re go read what an Orthodox Jew believes or a Hasidic Jew believes that Elijah will do when he returns. False prophet of the revelation of the last three and a half years fits him perfect. Okay, once again, I'm terrible with questions. Okay, so my question was, there will be some people still alive after the There will be lots of people, whatever that means, relatively speaking, so, alive. So then One third of the nations, when you look at just those surrounding ground zero. So how much more for the islands of the sea? And you and I, somebody says America in the Bible, we island of the sea. A big island, but nonetheless. <laughs> okay, so then we're ruling and reigning with Christ during the thousand years along with his people. Okay, all resurrected saints from Abel, including all, the, all of the tribulation saints, ruling and reigning with the Lord Jesus Christ for a thousand years. Emphasis on the martyred saints. But, Revelation but, 20, but verse 4. Too. Pardon? We're there, too. we're there. We came with Jesus. We're there. We came with Jesus. We were at the judgment seat of Christ. We were there. We don't have, there's two judgment seats you can get to. Judgment seat of Christ and a great white throne. Pick and choose. When does the judgment seat of Christ happen? When does it happen? Does not, there's no revelation of the judgment seat of Christ in, in Revelation chapter 4 to Revelation chapter 19. There's no revelation of it. It's happening during it. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so there are some people that have come through the tribulation. They came through. And they're, in the they're there. Okay. They're having babies. They have regular bodies. They've got regular bodies. <laughs> they got, we got resurrected bodies. They've got regular bodies. <laughs> that is absolutely true. <laughs> My question is, are some of those people getting saved in the thousand years of Christ? They don't need to be saved. They, they are, if they don't come up and keep the Feast of Tabernacles, if they don't come up to observe the witnesses of the, of, of the millennial temple that is in Jerusalem, the Lord, what does the Lord say he's going to do to them? They'll be plagued with the plagues of Egypt. Now, who, who is Satan going to deceive after the thousand years? All the natural people. Satan will be loose for a season. He's called Gog and Magog. He will be loose for a season, and anybody he can deceive during that time, he is allowed to deceive them. And the scriptures tells us that they will be gathered unto him as the sand upon the seashores, and then they will come up to try to destroy the resurrected saints. So they read the wrong news. They, they, that's how the power, that's the power of deception. You can live with the, with the Lord for a thousand years and look at angels and resurrected saints and Almighty God and believe that you can kill him. Satan has got this kind of deception, and you're going to make it through the tribulation? <laughs> got a high opinion of yourself. During the thousand years, he rules with a rod of iron. This is a question that is kind of out there, but we know I can prove this to you. He rules with a rod of iron and smashes things. If people sin during the tribulation, they immediately, they immediately are judged and end up in hell. Immediately. God 
commands that men go and look at the hole he makes at the end of the tribulation and look down and you can see the soul screaming out and dying in hell. It's part of, the, it's part of your annual journey. You do that for a thousand years. One every year, go visit the hole for a thousand years. That's what's going to happen to you, buddy. The resurrection saints are, uh, let's see, uh, Obadiah calls them saviors on every hill in Zion. So there's plenty of, there's plenty of, I mean, we're, let's think about it. You know, let's just say somebody's born 500 years into their mil, the millennial reign. Okay. They know nothing. All they know is Jesus, the, you know, the, the celestial city, the glory of God, the resurrected saints, angels. They see them everywhere. It's just common. This is just the way that they live. And now we're going to try to help them understand. Listen, Satan's going to be loose for a little season. He's a deceiver. He will begin to work on things that you don't even know exist in your being and your thinking. And he's going to cause you to feel desires. He's going to cause you to feel emotions. And you've got to be prepared to understand how to stand against sin and iniquity. It's going to be a part of, of the ministry of the deliverers on every hill in Zion. So, but when people sin, when, when king, king, he's going to subdue kingdoms. Smash them. He's going to be, he's, he's going to, he's going to um, be as a fuller soap and as a refiner's fire. Huh? And who should be able to abide the day of his coming? For he shall sit as a refiner's fire and a fuller soap, and he shall rule with a rod of iron. Now I'm bringing in Isaiah in, in along with uh, Malachi. Go ahead. Right. The, whole space of time where the first resurrection, end of the, tribu end of the tribulation, all the first, re first resurrection complete. The, the rest of the dead do not, are not going to be raised up for 1,000 years. And it uses the word live again. Okay, 1,000 years. So at the end, after, after that Satan, Gog and Magog, is loose for a little season, gathers together the, out, of, out of the earth, all the rebellious, Satan is bound forever. Every one of them cast into death and cast into hell. Okay, cast in hell and death is cast into the lake of fire. Okay, at that time, every dead, every person who died in rebellion against God will be raised up to receive an immortal body to be destroyed continually in hell, and, their, and, the, and the smoke of their torment shall ascend up before the throne of God forever. That's pretty radical, isn't it? You're living in the beauty of, beauty of God's divine, holy, and p glorious paradise, right? A new heaven and a new earth. But the smoke of their torment and their destruction ascends up before His throne forever. You not only will be able to see the city in which the new Jerusalem has come down, which don't, doesn't come down to earth until the end of the thousand years, you not only be able to see that from any place on the earth, you'll be able to see the smoke of their torment ascend. I believe that you'll be able to see the smoke of their torment ascend. It's going to be a serious witness and testimony. Somebody asked me, he said, why is there the, why is the millennial temple during, uh, why, is, why, why is this temple worship take a focus, Ezekiel 40 through 47? What's going on? Why is there such a different administration? Why is there these sacrifices going on? For the reason of helping people understand the story. Before the story was told in advance of the Lamb coming and offering himself to redeem us. Then it's told in reflection of the Redeemer that came and delivered man from their sin and iniquity by the sacrifice of himself. And it is displayed on that level. And it's perfect because Father came up with the idea. Amen. Another question. I'll get, okay. After, just a, it's a quick one. Sorry. Okay. After the thousand years when Satan's loose, will he be able to deceive any of the partakers of the first resurrection? No. Now, the question was, can, the first, can those of the first resurrection be deceived after? No. There's no reason or evidence to ever believe that. They've been purified. The Lord said this. See, this is what people don't get. If you overcome, even as I overcome, you sit down with me in my throne, even as I sit down with my Father in His throne. It's done. God cannot be tempted. God tempts no one with evil, which is the balance of understanding, lead me not into temptation, which is really, do not allow me to be led into temptation. God cannot... Be tempted with evil, nor does he tempt anyone. And we are, we're, we'll see him like he is because we'll be like him. 
That is an amazing thing what he's going to do at the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's just an amazing thing. It goes beyond, it's mind-boggling, you know. It's almost like, you know, it's too, too sacred, too wonderful to even utter. Go ahead. Right. What, what scale or uh, who are those type of people on how big of a scale is that? They were just, they were Old Testament saints belonging to that, to the Old Testament times. And, you know, uh, they went into the holy city and that's it. That's all we know. The Lord didn't tell us it was 10, 20, 100, 200, as you just left it there. So there's no, there's no other evidence. There's no other evidence. How big of a group of people? Nope, it just... His resurrection was so shocking, so powerful. There was, you know, I, you know, if you want me to guess, I'm going to say Moses, Job, Abraham was in it. And you're not going to get Abraham out of the grave with a new resurrected body without Sarah. But it's just speculation, you know. God's got, God's got, some, God's got some highlighted people who sold out for him. And I'm telling you, I'm not going to be in the nosebleed section. I'm not going to walk past that great company of saints and be hanging my head going. I made it here by the skin of my teeth. We're going out. We're going to fight the fight. We're going to fight the fight and run the race to win. Amen. Right. If you're going to go for a race, if you're going to go run a marathon, or are you going to go run a half a marathon, are you going to go run a 5K, whatever, don't walk. At least run. Even if, if, even if it's this. Which you could actually walk faster, but I mean, come on. <laughs> Run through. Okay. Okay. Let's go look at it. So, where do you want to start? You want to start at verse 11? Where, where specifically are you at right now? Okay, so I say then, had they stumbled that they should fall, God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation came to the Gentiles. We know what that happened when that happened 2,000 years ago. Okay? For to, provoke them to, for, to, for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminish of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? So that means they're coming back. They're going to be, they're going to be brought back in. So you actually want to hook up 2 Corinthians chapter 3 with this, okay? Where, you know, the, the veil is over their eyes. Which Paul is actually then taking it, as it were, almost to another level with respect to what Jesus said, the prophet Isaiah is fulfilled, seeing you should not see, hearing you should not hear, and with your heart you should not understand, lest you should be converted, and I should heal you. I should heal you and you should be converted. And then of course, then Paul said of course, at the again, at, in his dealings with Israel in the end of Acts, where he said, rightly has Isaiah prophesied concerning you. Okay, so this is the bringing back in. So right here, this is the 70th week. We're, we're talking about the 70th week where the veil is removed. Here, we're beginning, we're talking about the 70th week. So it, it's once again going back. When, what, what is God's focus? What, he's, was it all men be saved? It's wide open to every man, okay? He's not dealing in any way specifically with any nation. He's made everybody equal, Okay. Jew and Gentile alike, okay? Scythian, same as the Jew. One new man. He's removed the, partition, the, the wall of partition, okay? Between Israel and between the Gentiles. So it's for everyone, Israel, all the nations. But that doesn't in any way fulfill the 70th week. The 70th week of God's specific dealings with Israel as a nation has not taken place. And it must take place. And it must last for seven years. According to the things that Daniel said. 
And, and during that time, temple worship, temple must be built and temple worship must now be reinstituted and God must be in the midst of it. So that's a radical shift. Once again, the, the temple cannot be made desolate if, unless his glory is there. Because it is a terminology that is rich within all uh, temple protocol. And, 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 and especially in Leviticus. There are certain sins that if those sins are done even by the priest or the king, the glory will depart. And now there is a means by which that sin or those iniquities can be purgated. The word that is most commonly used for kippur is atone, but it's not the right word. It's purgate. It's because we understand from the ancient use of the language, which was pre theology of atonement from ancient Eucharist and Akkadian. Kippur always meant or was used for detergents that took out the worst kinds of stains. So it's pure gate. Okay? So those sins had to be pure gated, then the divine presence would come back in. Okay? So that's, that's a very important po point to their fullness. Now, they're the focus. They're the center of what Father's doing. Okay? It's, when you look at the whole scope of prophecy, it's very different than what a lot of people want to accept. The resurrected saints are ruling over the 12 tribes of Israel. The Father's going to make their seed like the sand of the sea, sand upon the seashore and the stars in the The Gentiles in there? Yeah. But primarily what we're doing right now, and what this is all about is the resurrected saints, those who are going to be a part of Father's eternal kingdom, those whose father has, those who, who, you know, father has redeemed from Adam's transgression and sin. Okay, so going on, try to get to, the, to your point. Now, if it followed them, okay, for, for I speak to you Gentiles and as much as I apostle the Gentiles magnify my office, if by any means I may provoke it to emulation that which is the flesh, that may, may, the, some of them may be saved. For if the casting away of them be the reconciliation of the world, when were they cast away? No man shall eat of this tree forever, kind of thing, you know. Dry up at the roots. It's done. I leave your house desolate. You cast them away. Right? That was, that was when? When he was crucified. And he turned to the Gentiles and he opened up a whole new door, a whole other, a whole other dimension to the Gentile nation. Did you know that Israel did not even, I mean, the church didn't even believe that you could still preach to the Gentiles for nine years after his resurrection. I mean, Cornelius was a big event. That they saw that the Holy Ghost was given to the Gentiles. That's nine years after, man. Some people argue for 10. I don't care, nine, 10 years after. The resurrection, okay? Um, a lot of this really has to come into play in our thinking to understand where, where the mentality was with, with, with this. So they were, they were cast away, okay? So... If the casting away of them is the reconciling of the world, in other words, now the door is open up to all nations, not just to Israel only, all nations, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? So the point of it is they're going to be received back in. And in a way, in, in a very special way, in a very unique way in which God is going to deal with them to where that their eyes are going to be open so that they can behold the one that they pierced, as Zechariah said. For if the first fruits be holy, the lump is holy. If the root be holy, then the branches. And if some of them branches be broken off and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in and among them and with them partakers of the root. And what are we talking about? We're talking about the kingdom now, right? We're not talking about Israel as a nation because the kingdom is for, the kingdom of God is before Israel as a nation. So if you can be grafted into the kingdom of God, they broken off. And you being a wild olive tree can be grafted in, okay? Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root bears thee. That will say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Israel was removed out of the way so that I, as a Gentile, part of the Gentile nation, could become a part of it. True. But what does the Lord say? Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. Broken off of what? Kingdom of God, Okay? And thou standest by faith, be not high-minded. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also cut you off. 
Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fail severity, but towards thee goodness, if thou continue in the goodness. Otherwise, you're going to be cut off too, just like Israel was cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. So they get to be grafted in even right now. It's not like the door is closed. If you're a Jew, you can't be saved. It's not, that, that would be a, a wrong conclusion. For God is able to graft them in again. For if that were cut out of an olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these which, are, which be the natural branches be grafted into, our, into their own olive tree? Well, the kingdom of God. Their natural branches. Look, there's an event. It's going to happen. It can happen now. And it's going to happen on a national sense. And that's the point. It can happen on an individual sense. But it's happened on a national sense? In a national sense? No, not for a moment. For 2,000 years, not for a moment. For 2,000 years, they have cleaved. And I'm going to tell you right now, there's some radical things. You can get some radical testimonies of where rabbis were, were, were shot and didn't, didn't suffer any harm during, uh, during uh, the, uh, the Holocaust, during Hitler. All kinds of miraculous things. You can look at miraculous things that took place back in the days of, of Rambam, Mohammedes. He, Ram, Ramadan prophesied the whole uh, Ottoman Empire. He prophesied, he said it would be 80 jubilees. He prophesied everything to 2017. Back in the 12th century, he's the guy who put the whole Old Testament together and, 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 and was used, used to resurrect the Old Testament so everybody could read it because only a handful of people could read it. It was kept in the hands of the Levites, the Kohanim, and, 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 and the, the people, the priest of Zadok, which they kept track of that even to this day, all the way through since... Since the dispersia, the dispora rather. Have they been coming, have they, has there been a national bringing them back in? No. There will be a national bringing them back in. That's the 70th week. That's the return. Because all this is happening with Daniel going, when shall we return? When shall you, when shall you no longer uh, be angry with us? When, when shall you heal us? When shall we um, receive back that blessing that you promised us by the mouth of Jeremiah? I mean, those kinds of, those kinds of prayers, that, those kinds of requests. So this, that's, what we're, that's what we're dealing with here. Okay, so for if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature and grafted in contrary to nature, then into a good olive tree, how much more shall these which are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not, for I would not, brethren, that you would be ignorant of this mystery. Okay, the mystery that they will be nationally grafted back in. That's the mystery. They will be grafted back in as a nation. In the seventieth week, and the, and the Jesus will rule from Jerusalem, not from America, not from Timbuktu, from Jerusalem, in the midst of the children of Abraham. There is an eternal and perpetual covenant there with them. They will be brought back in by way of the blood of Jesus Christ, with a special, unique dealing with them when the veil is taken off. The blinders are removed. The deception is no longer hovering over them. The, when they had an incurable womb, a prophecy was given. Seeing you shall not see. When God says you can't see, that means you're blinded. Hearing you cannot hear. It doesn't matter how they could. They, they, they were stuck in a, in a realm of darkness because of the rebellion and deception. Okay? For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of the mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. That's why I said that I put, not where Larkin puts, this is one of the reasons that I put the end of the times of the Gentiles, or the fullness of the Gentiles, right there before the beginning of the tribulation, before the beginning of the 70th week. Okay? That's why, and people have problems with it because when you say that, then there's no more dealing with the Gentiles. Then, then Gentiles can't be saved. They cannot be, by that virtue of that argument, which there's a lot more scriptures to build on this, and I don't have time to do it, obviously, that they will not be a part of the first resurrection. That period, that administration is over. Now it's all about Israel. God dealing with the nation of Israel raises up 144,000, draws all of Israel, even returns Obadiah, Jeremiah, Isaiah said even the northern kingdoms will be brought back in during that time. I mean, that is wild thought because 
they went in total diaspora. No one even knows that they're, those northern kingdoms, they don't even know that they're Jewish. They don't even know what tribe they belong to. And God's going to go get the northern kingdoms that have been lost completely, the, 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 you know, the lost tribes of Israel, right? He said they're going to come back in. He's going to bring them back in. He's going to fish them in. And that's part of the job of the 144,000. It's pretty radical stuff. And we, can, we, be, we base this on a lot of things that Ezekiel said. Okay? And then you see the cultists of this why People get, I mean, I, I know people who have studied the word that are very good at Hebrew, that are studied the word relentlessly, and they're like, they're still just sitting there going, I can't deal with Ezekiel 40 to 47. Help me. How is this? The millennials looks, the millennial reign of Christ looks like the same cultus that was established by Moses. What do we go back to the law? Is it, is it, what, 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 it's just all temple worship. And, and, it, and it, it's, it's different. It's different. It's got a, it's got a purpose. It's, it's clearly explained. I can do that for you. But most important point that I want to make, I want to make is that Israel, the temple, Jerusalem, eternal city. When the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven, bang! <laughs> it superimposes. After a new heaven and a new earth, it's the new Jerusalem. Literally. It comes, it's the new Jerusalem. It's, it's the heavenly Jerusalem that superimposes upon the earthly Jerusalem. And that's it. That's what God says. And now we take, as it were, now we take the cultists of temple worship. Look at the temple. Go online, go online, Google, and you'll see where very diligent, orthodox Haradim Jews have, have made models of the millennial temple. And it's beautiful, and it's grandiose, and it's bigger than the temple of Solomon, and it's bigger than the temple of Herod. It's amazing. Center of everything that Jesus is going to be doing in the millennial reign. And it's just hard to get your head wrapped around that. And it's not going back to the law. It's the government of God, and it's severe. And he rules with a rod of iron, and he smashes. And he doesn't allow sin and iniquity. Not one. Adultery, you go right to the pit, just like Korah and Dathan. Papa has zero tolerance for sin. Zero tolerance for iniquity. Against popular, modern, post-apostasy, <laughs> Has, or I'm not going to say post apostasy, but post apostasy having begun. So apostasy is here, in other words. Father has no tolerance for sin. His mercy and grace. If you sin, you know what he's done. You know what he's willing to do. If you want to get it right, he'll wash you and cleanse you. How many times? How many times you need? Isn't that amazing? It's not that way in the millennial reign. It's just not that way. You just know, can't find any scripture that it's that way. But Satan's out of the picture too. And you don't have television with all the iniquity. It's like Ruthiana said to me one day, she, let me set up for you. She said, Dad, why is it that people can go into the demonic and go into iniquity and go into the occult and just get there deep, quick? And yet, if we start bring, trying to bring them into the things of God, it just takes for a long, long time. I said, imagine this, baby. What if... Instead of all of the propaganda and all the lies and all the influences of Satan, we had rather everything was all about the kingdom of God, all about the ways of God, your television commercials, huh, your news, the billboards, everybody around you talking, you know, all of the publications, all of the media, all the conversation, you're interacting, you know, with, with angels and resurrected saints, you know. Come on. It's just a different, it's a different thing. You don't... You don't have all that propaganda influence, the less of the less, less of the eye and the pride of life that isn't just about Satan. It's about what Satan is doing through men. Now it's a holy realm. Now it's just a holy realm. Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo! I cannot wait. I was like, for me, you know, I, I spend so much time thinking about it, talking about it. For me, it's just so real. If you think it's not surreal, it's so real. And if you spend a lot of time thinking about these things, talking about them, giving your life to them, it becomes so real. 
It's like you already there. The only said, why do we need to talk about prophecy? Because you need to get into prophecy, man. You need to be living it. This is what's really going on. This is what lasts forever. What you're dealing with right now is temporal. Amen. Any other, did I answer your question? Okay. Well, I, I believe that we can, I believe that we can provoke Israel under jealousy now. But this is the final thing. This is the final thing. Does that classify as uh, the signs in the heavens that they're referring to? In the day of Jesus and that it alluded to by some of the prophets, it can be. It's not really, we're not real clear on that. We can't, it's still kind of up there for Maybe so, um, but I believe that there are going, there clearly are encounters. Will the Lord allow them to see when the blinders are taken off? Will the Lord allow some of them at least to see the meeting in the air? Because that's going to be, that's sizable, that's sizable. Yeah, and it, because immediately there's going to be 144,000 virtuous Jews. I mean, I know... I know Jewish people right now who they spend, they, they spend all day. They don't go to work. They spend all day reading the Word. And then when they're done reading the Word, they spend three, four hours in the evening um, doing some kind of a job, some kind of a task. Some are actually supported to do it because they're, they're Levites. Others do it because they, they've just made their life very, very modest. They make it to where that they eat just a modest amount of food and live very modestly so they don't have to work very much so they can devote their time to doing nothing but reading the word and crying out to God and asking for Messiah to come. And this is about how they look, you know. And it's just all day long. And it's pretty radical. What, wouldn't it be beautiful if God's people could do that? We're so materially minded. We've got to have this and we've got to have that and we've got to have the other thing and we get all this stuff stacked up. We don't think like they think. Look, the most important thing is give myself to the word. So I want to leave, I want to make sure that I'm not over, overloaded with debt and, and, and need for finances. I'm going to live very modestly. So for the single purpose of giving myself to knowing God. And that's about as close as you can get to seeking first the kingdom of God. But they're doing it in ignorance, not according to knowledge. So there is a, an event, clearly, a supernatural event that the Lord is going to use to remove the blinders off of at least 144,000 that are that way. They won't drink a Coke. They won't drink a Coke. They won't drink anything that, or partake of anything that has shown anyone uh, dressed in modestly. And what we would call dressed in modestly, uh, what they would call dressed in modestly, we would think would, we would call it modest. Relativism. They're just, if it, it arouses any emotion of lust, it's evil. Okay? And they're just dedicated to this. And, and, and did the Lord put that in them? There's no question in my heart and mind that the Lord put that in them. Have they seen Jesus yet? No. They are so indoctrinated um, that they have not seen Jesus. They have deprogrammers. In other words, if you're an Orthodox Jew and somebody tells you about Jesus and he start, starts working on you, you go to the deprogrammers and they're brilliant guys, brilliant rabbis who can erase every, every, every remembrance from your mind, your psyche to Jesus. That's going to change. It, did it, was there any other question? I mean, these are great questions. Okay, yeah. Did, does that really fit here? Are you one? Okay. <laughs> did I say the deeds of Nicolaitans recently? Okay. I don't believe I did, but I could have. Well, the Nicolaitans were a group of Gnostics. Who are most like the Gnostics today? Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's Witness are the true Gnostics. It's all about the Gnosis. And um, that's why they would never be able to believe that Jesus uh, is, is God. Because they can't see, as true Gnostics, they cannot see the, the things of God come into the flesh. Now, they believe this. That as long as you do not sin with the Pneuma, which is spirit, uh, then you are acceptable to the Lord. 
but if but you could do but the the soma the body is innately evil and you can do anything with your body it's totally fine just don't sin with your spirit so you can commit adultery fornication lasciviousness you do anything with your body gluttony whatever doesn't matter and um, so they they are very hedonistic the Gnostics are there is a sect of Gnostics that are very hedonistic um, specific sins of the Nicolaitans in, in that context um, well, one of the things that they would, be denied, they would deny that Jesus came in the flesh. That God came in the flesh. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. That's right. Jehovah's Witness says, it doesn't say in the Bible that Jesus was God. I said, many times. How many times do you want? They're looking at me. You're kidding me. No, I'll show you hundreds of times. Where do you want me to begin? You ready? Just sit down and start listening. Because that's always the first thing they're going to say. I hope that you're skilled enough to show them hundreds of times in the Scripture, in the Gospels alone, that Jesus is God. Don't even have to pull out, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. And Nicolaitans, hands down, no, there was no way. Then. Okay? We're done. We're, Cho? Okay, I, 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 I'll take one more. Hands up. Was there, did I see another hand over there? Wait, wait, Joe? Right. Well, first of all, first of all, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say that there is an elliptical adiposis in there, which is a very difficult grammatical challenge in the Greek language, and then try to be superimpose it on the English language. So what I'm going to do, the best way to do it, and I have my own translation of it, and it's a little bit deeper, and so it's where I said, you know, we're at 101, okay? We're, we're in, we're in, we're in uh, Prophecy 101, and then there's uh, 201, okay? So this is 201, but I'm going to take it for just a minute, and, and I'm going to show you something, okay? And the best way to do it is, there's a couple of things that, that Paul highlights that we have to keep in the, in, within the framework of what we say. Number one, he had already said something to them. He already discovered, disclosed something to them. He tells them, I've already told you this. I've already told you about this, okay? And so um, we know what he already told them because we read it, you know, about how the dead in Christ shall rise first. So they already, there, there was certain things that we know that he had already told them and then there are some things that he reveals here in chapter 2 that we didn't know that he had already told them. So he told them verbally and it wasn't written down. So the, the best thing to do here is to really kind of just start in verse 5 and begin to, and to, begin to work ourselves back. And, 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 and let me help you with this. So remember verse 5. Remember, remember, don't you remember? Let me say it that way because I don't like remember ye not. That's a tough one. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining or holding back, what restrains, what prevents the unveiling or what re prevents um, the revelation, the unveiling, the disclosure of the man of sin, the Antichrist, and the, and the period of time in which he exists. Okay, so I'm, I'm not only looking here, I'm looking at the Greek text. And I'm happy to take anyone, and I believe people need to go through the Greek text on this. Because it is a very challenging, what we would call pericope of scripture, that you, because it, when you have an, um, an this, what, what is, phrased as an elliptical apodosis. It means that there is something there that is not written, but yet it's assumed. And so now we're allowed to assume it. Then furthermore, the Greek grammar is challenging for the best Greek scholars. 
So what you have to do is you have to write out about three to four ways in which you can understand what's being said in this pericope, especially chapter verses one, two, three, one, two, and three, which kind of sets the tone. So that's why I think it's good to, to, to work back and keep it in context of the big picture because we're not gonna take a pericope that has tough Greek grammar and trump all this other information. We're gonna have to take a pericope that has very tough Greek grammar and understand it in view of all the rest of the information because that we do that in so many respects, in so many different ways in, in uh, the interpretation uh, of, of our understanding of the word of God. So we, we, we hear, for the mystery of sin, or the mystery of iniquity, or the mystery of, forgive me, not sin, mystery of iniquity, or the mystery of anomas, lawlessness, okay? No law. It already works. What is he talking about? Antichrist. He's talking about what's really going to be fully blown, um, what's going to come to full-blown revelation during the tribulation. Was Paul speaking in view of the revelation that God reserved for John? No. Was Paul speaking in part concerning the revelation that God gave him of end time? Yes. Important chronology issue. Are you with me? God chose to give John the revelation of all the specifics to full, fill in all the blanks of Daniel. He gave to Paul, an understanding of these things in part, and he gave them specific parts. And the most specific parts that God gave to Paul, are you with me? Paul never saw the book of Revelation. He died by 66 AD. The book of Revelation was not written out until 90 AD, almost 30 years later. Okay? Important points. The mystery of iniquity already works, or the man of sin, the mystery of lawlessness, Okay, it's already works. Antichrist spirit's already here. John said the same thing, right? But he says, but there is one who now withholds. Okay, until he, okay. Now he who withholds will continue to withhold until he is taken out of the way. So there is something that withholds or stands, holds back lawlessness, that iniquity, that level of sin, that level of deception, that level of wrath. Lord, is there 10 righteous? Will you save the city for 10 righteous? For 10 righteous, I'll save it. Now, he's gonna pour out the wrath. There is no intercession for the state of the earth. The grapes of wrath are fully ripe. Sin can't get any riper. There is no intercession on the part of men. That's why I truly believe that there is no more harvest by the time that the tribulation comes. When will the Lord come? When there is no more harvest. Father is going to deal with men until there is no more getting, no more, no more headway with them. The time of the Amorites, time of the Gentiles, the time of the Gentiles have fully come. Not just fulfilled. Time of Gentiles fully come. What happened with the time of the Amorites? Abraham, I'm not going to let you possess this land until the time of the Amorites has fully come. I'm still dealing with them. They are not beyond being reached. Are you with me? When the, God dealt with them, He dealt with them in so many different ways, but ultimately there came a point in time where all of a sudden they were beyond salvation. They were beyond help. So what did God say? Wipe them out. Kill them. Men, women, boy, child, baby, everything. Destroy it. It's nothing but evil. It has been proven it cannot be cured. Are you with me? It's a disease. You listening? Understand what I'm saying here? So what we're saying is there's something, there is a power, there is a force, there is, there is an entity that holds back this, not only the Antichrist being revealed, but what comes along with the Antichrist. The wrath of God being poured out because it's not tribulation, not about the Antichrist. Tribulation is about the, about the wrath of God being poured out. And it's just in that period of time when now now this hindrance or, 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 or that, that time, that dealing of God, that grace is removed. Every evil thing rises up. Antichrist, a false messiah, Satan comes, a complete end of every, full, every revelation of iniquity. 
This is, this is important to understand in the context of Second Thessalonians. You can't understand these passages without looking at what are we talking about here? It's like people trying to describe what faith is. We're justified by faith. Well, what do you mean? You're justified by faith. And then I hear blah, 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 blah. Faith is that you are born of the Spirit. If any man be in Christ, you new creation. Old things passed away. Be, receive a new heart, new spirit. That's the faith, the new birth. The new creation, that's the faith. People want to say we're justified by faith as though it's just like, you know, some kind of abstract belief in, in a God and, and, and that his name is Jesus. No, it's a miracle, a new birth. Man, that's the faith that justifies us. I can't understand the specifics apart from the general overview or the context in which I'm trying to express those specifics. Does that all make sense yes. to everyone? Okay, so. And then... That wicked one shall be revealed. And then, at that moment in time, his wrath is going to be poured out. Fire is going to rain down on Sodom and Gomorrah. Are you listening to me? Okay. Now, the first part of it, what I would rather do for you, and I, and I will do it at some other time for everybody. And Some of you have already been through this drill with me. And I have this posted also. I will walk you through the ways of translating the first part of it, which makes it kind of confusing where people think, wait a minute, that, the, that, that Satan or, or the Antichrist has to first come before Jesus is going to come. No, 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 no. The Antichrist will come before Jesus returns to set up his kingdom. They're saying the resurrection has already passed. The resurrection hasn't already passed because the resurrection is going to happen when Jesus returns. It's going to happen before Jesus returns. At the time of his return, then the resurrection is fulfilled. Then you can say you resurrected from the dead. Okay, that's really the context. Okay, so then we have to begin to understand we're talking about there is a day of the Lord in which he comes and he sets up his kingdom. That's the second coming. Paul's not talking about, he's not talking about at the last trump, Jesus would descend with the voice of an archangel and the sound of a trumpet and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet him in the air. He's not referring to that, 1 Thessalonians 4.16. He's talking about when Jesus actually returns with 10,000 of the saints after the judgment seat of Christ, after the marriage supper of the Lamb to set up his eternal kingdom. That cannot happen. That's the resurrected saints. That's the eternal kingdom. Do you know that there are people that are still like that today that are left over from that time period that believe that we're in the millennial right now? They teach in Bible schools. They believe we're in the millennial right now. We're in the millennial reign of Christ. Tribulation happened in 70 A.D. Okay? So he, when we begin to deal with these different ideas and different theological perspectives, you can begin to see how they flow in here and how ultimately there's still remnants of what Paul was dealing with at that moment in time, even to this day. And he's saying, wait a minute, the Lord's not going to, the day of the Lord will not come. It, it, there's going to be a great falling away that's going to happen first. The man of sin is going to be revealed first. But he's not saying the catching away is going to, uh, he's not saying that the, the day of the Lord is the catching of the what, catching away. In fact, he's saying rather, when, and that's why he started later, he's saying rather this. He's saying that there is a hinderer that withholds the Antichrist from being revealed. And that hinderer that withholds him, that withholds all that comes along with him, especially the wrath of God, has to be removed. Then the lawlessness can sweep in. So here's the chronology event. There is a hinderer that withholds. Somebody said, why didn't he just say the church? I don't know, that's a good question to ask him. Why is, this, why is that shrouded in mystery? I don't know, ask Paul. I don't know, but he did shroud it. You, okay, he shrouded it by calling him uh, the hinderer of iniquity. So then it's one of three things. One of three things. Either it's the governments of men, because that's what, that hinders lawlessness, right? Praise God for police running around, governments. Right? Throw you in jail. Do something wrong, right? Holy Ghost. Or it's the church. There's not a fourth option. Governments are still here during the tribulation. Holy Ghost is still here during the tribulation because the works of the Holy Ghost are going to be seen. 
if no one else, works of the Holy Ghost going to be seen between, be in the midst of Elijah and Enoch, the two witnesses. But the works of the Holy Ghost going to be seen in, in the 144,000 and, 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 the, and the works that they do. It has to be the church. Why did he shroud the church in mystery? I don't know. Perhaps he didn't know. We, he's the one who said we, we see in part and we prophesy in part. Isn't he, one, isn't, he, isn't he the one who said that? Paul said that. He's, he's the one who said that. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. <laughs> and um, however, there is no place in the doctrine of Paul anywhere that he viewed himself going through such a tribulation. Or put it this way. There is no place anywhere that Paul viewed himself as being around when the wicked one should be revealed. However, he did view himself as being around when the catching away took place. You want to go through that logic again? Okay, got it? That's a very important point. Why is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 through 7, shrouded in a certain mystery? Why it is a very difficult Greek that everybody wrestles with? I don't know. I wrestled with it. I wrestled translating it, trying to translate it. After I had gotten pretty good at Greek, I think I spent a year on it. I just back and forth. I spent a long time with it. It's just, it's a puzzle. And um, just as how, to, how to do it accurately. That's what I was back and forth on. How do, how do I do this most perfectly? How do I do this most accurately? How do I bring things out that's there, that's hidden away? And, I, and there are things hidden away that you can bring out that even makes it more profound in making the point that I just made. I wouldn't do it because I don't think it's necessary. I wouldn't make that the place or the battle, the, 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 ba the battleground that I would try to defend. I would leave it to some degree as elusive as even the King James translators translated it, just emphasizing those points that I just made, okay? And happy to write that out for anybody if you need it. I think we're done. We done? We're done. I know I got you moving now with questions, but good. Love all you guys. Bless you. In Jesus' mighty name. <laughs>